uh, as you mourn for Babylon, remember that she aborted her children. And then right. see Revelation 18. And <clears throat> like, and just the pastors are piling on like, what? No. Da, 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 da. It says sorcery. And I'm like, mm-hmm. They did do yeah, the pharmacia, work. you dumbasses. Right. But here's the key. What they don't also do is oh, they don't recognize. Thanks. That's awesome. They they don't look at what um, what John is his source material. Mm-hmm. What's he what's he using? He's using Isaiah, mm-hmm. uh, Isaiah forty seven, which is even more explicit and yeah. explicit in a number of ways, right? Right, right. <laughs> it's just beautiful, and you're like looking at it. It's like yeah, I know that's Hebrew, but you can use Septuagint. But the Hebrew word too. It's it's like mm-hmm. it's there's the no way. You, no, I I did the work. You can't dispute the context right. there, especially mm-hmm. Revelation, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit, but not not. Not the same picture, not the no. same illustration being no. used by Isaiah. Isaiah's no. like, she, because because it's both. It's the pharmacia, you know, it's pharmacia for both aborting, but also mm-hmm. then she thinks it's fertility treatments too. Correct. Right. So they have all that magic medicine potions for fertility as well. Yes. Right. So it's both, and like, and and it's a and God just mocks it. It's like you're, you have no children because you aborted them, and you think that you can just take a potion and it's gonna they're gonna come back when who gives life right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it was kind of fun. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's, uh, sorry, I'm doing two things at once while you're talking. No, I understand. We're letting people um, jump on here. There's Paul. <clears throat> no, it's just frustrating to watch people, what do you want to say? It's an interesting thing that in the guild, you're, mm. you butt up against people who say, well, what you just related, which is like, no, that's not true. And it's like, you're a member of the guild. Right. Like our do expectation. The work. Yeah, do right. the work. Our expectations for you are so low. But. It's like from Aristotle on, that word means yes. magic potions. And there were four basic uses. Right. Like to throw up, to to mm-hmm. to expel everything, the other end. Mm-hmm. To right. expel the child. And I forget right. the other one. It's, it's basically well, four. The, the thing about that is then that. When you, especially so the translators the, get say it, they all get it wrong, right? Yeah, they just call it this sorcery. And you're like, what? Right. Well, but in Israel, it's so much more serious. That's the thing. Well, there's that too. Yeah, there's that too. Is is we as, don't even take it seriously. That's what I'm saying. Is like when you when you read the like the Revelation text and you do your due diligence in the words and so forth. I'm like, oh, that's serious. But then again, as is the case, when you look at the history of Israel, like we've talked about countless times about Hezekiah. I brought this up at Bible study the other morning. Oh, I know. That, that text you, is so when remarkable. When they rediscover anything. And they're weeping. And and I brought it up in the context of a previous conversation we had about, you know, when you memory hole something or you just lose history, you just forget. Just mm-hmm. organically, you just lose it because like something... The, re- like, like the mud floods of the 1870s mud floods and or 80s. the Roman cement versus Portland cement and just that very yeah. simple transition. You're like, well, what happened? We, we lost it. Well, how'd you lose it? Well, there was some cheaper stuff that we started to use, and then nobody thought it was important to write down the previous recipe. And are you here calling we are. the guild cheap? Yes, <clears throat> cheap and tacky, and lazy. Is, I mean, that's another way to put it, right? I suppose. And yeah. and that's the thing, though, is that you you brought up. It's like the parable that I I used last week about Kierkegaard and the um, skating out to the middle of the lake to get the diamond. And, you know, every generation says it's too dangerous. We got to tame it. So we're not going to grab the diamond out of the ice. We're going to touch it. We're not going to touch it. We're going to get close to it. We're not going to get close to it. We're just going to talk about it. And eventually those men who did that brave deed and were celebrated for it, within three or four or five generations, they're taught to children as myths. They're not even real people anymore. Mm. Because what happens is the, the further away from that event you get the more mythologized it becomes. Right. And I was just doing this yesterday with um, Teutonic legends and Teutonic history and just kind of reading about that and the Nibelung saga, that all of these people were real people, but throughout through time, they became more and more mythic and more and more legendary and there was more and more embellishment huh, added huh. to the original stories. That's what, I was just reading the Hebrew <clears throat> study Bible this morning with, yeah. the, with the folks. On, on the sacrifice of Isaac. Mm-hmm. And they do the same thing in the study Bible with Abraham. Right. He, right. He's a real, they don't discourage, they don't say he's not a real figure, but right. they but all the things that happen to him mm-hmm. are, have this grand metaphorical Correct. kind of usage, right. right? So it's not like, 
even if they didn't happen or they did happen, it doesn't mm -hmm. even matter. It's just like, well, what does it teach us? Right. And I think that's key because I was thinking about that this morning in relation to, well, that topic of what you have to ask, what is the trajectory of the statement that's being made? Does it lead you somewhere positive or somewhere negative? Is it an attempt to relativize something or attempt to concretize something? It's not enough to simply say, but so-and-so said this or such-and-such such taught this. Okay, yeah. but what was the trajectory of that teaching? It's one thing to say that Abraham was real, but the events are mythical versus what Abraham did was real and what happened to him is real, but we are so removed from the original situation, the original event or the phenomena that it, we find it difficult to believe it. Well, it's just interesting how they d and how they had to dance around Correct. sacrifice. They say, well, right. sacrifice is qualitatively different than um, uh, than justice. And we're like, well, mm. how, where, how are you getting to that? Because yeah. they're saying, well, like Sodom, I mean, that was mm -hmm. a matter of, of justice, right? That was forensic. But but Abraham and Isaac, that's a sacrifice. So it has like a higher spiritual kind of value. Yeah. You're, like, you're still... He's still sacrificing. You're playing word games, and you're also yeah. bringing in paganism. This is the problem with all these things at root is, really, it's just the old Adam attempting to explain away the text so that they can explain away reality. Because again, if I say Abraham was real, Isaac was real, but the event itself is mythologized, then I can do the same thing with the Lord's Supper in the present tense, which is what we do. Same thing with the whole scripture, right? With all of scripture. You hate to call that like a slippery slope, but... But then again, it's, like we've seen... I don't think it's seen... a slippery slope. I think it's just a cliff. <laughs> like you just right, dive right. off. Right, right. Well, I made that point, like with, um, you know, with the with the Supreme Court leak, yeah. um, with the pastors, I was saying, like, everybody who said that Obergefell was going to be a slippery slope, mm -hmm. and I'm like, no, no, no. It was the people who said that <laughs> no-fault divorce was a slippery slope. And you yeah. just keep going back, right? It's mm -hmm. like, if you undermine the, the constitutive estate of... of right. <laughs> ...of the world, which mm -hmm. is the family, mm -hmm. if you undermine that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you open the door to whatever. I mean, right. there's no, there's nothing right. to hold back the gates. Right. Right. Well, we talked about this briefly yesterday, texting back and forth, which is the subtext of the original temptation to mm. take the fruit and eat and be like God, knowing good and evil, is to reverse engineer creation. Because if if the mm -hmm. woman falls, there is no children, there's no progeny, and therefore God's promise that you will multiply and spread over the face of the earth. That's done. There is no, there is nobody else after man and woman. Right. So the subtext is your womb now is closed, and therefore creation itself is doomed. And then God takes that, and in the promise says, "I'm oh, I'll just going adopt, to, right? Yeah, I mean, right. I, I, no, this I'll, is a serious judgment. <laughs> I'll weaponize your womb instead, and mm -hmm. now your womb will become your downfall, Satan. And this then is the subtext for everything that comes after, which is Satan's whole." purpose for attacking us is, first of all, obviously to rip us apart from God's promise, which is Christ, but then secondly, as a consequence, to annihilate creation. So by attempting to close the woman's womb and therefore close the future for creation, there is no more multiplication, there is no more spreading over the earth, there is no more childbirth, and then God reverse engineering that and using that against, say, in the promise, the old Adams then the old Adam's whole scheme from then on is we'll determine how the womb is utilized for the negation or the propagation of creation. Yeah, right. Because we say right. it this way. The old it, Adam it, it, wants to be God in God's place. This uh -huh. is our argument, that the first right. commandment is always to us, I can be God in God's place. But then we never factor in, well, in order to be God in God's place, I have to control life and death, which comes up in the scriptures. In Hannah's song, in Mary's song, it comes up constantly. Right, and, and it's transhumanism. Yeah. That's our new term for it, but it's not a new right. thing. No, it's not. We're going to transcend. No, because look at Egyptian hieroglyphs. Look right. at Egyptian hieroglyphs. Right. Well, they part they did human, it through part animal. And they, right, and they do it through uh, intermarriage, and they you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> or not intermarriage. What is the opposite? Oh, incest. But, mm -hmm. I mean, they no, they're trying to engineer right society, engineer one hundred percent people. Right, as one comedian said, when you complain about. A certain group of people being athletically gifted or athletically <laughs> dominant in right, American right. culture. Well, of right. course they are because they were bred for hundreds of years. They took the strongest male and the strongest female and they interbred them in order to make the strongest slaves who oh, could carry the heaviest that. weight, work the longest in the field. Mm -hmm. And therefore, genetically speaking, we in this country especially did an experiment for over 
200, 300 years in which we determined we're going to make the perfect slave. And we right. did. And then those people then genetically, just generation after generation after generation, you're saying, okay, well, yeah, but we did that to them. And now they get to read the benefits of that at least. But let's not pretend like this just happened organically. It did. It's kind of, it is. I mean, it's kind of funny because it's like, survival of the fittest it's mm -hmm. acted like it's like some law of nature mm -hmm. but it but it but it is the law of the of the sinful heart right right exactly it's compulsion right. who is worthy and well prepared mm -hmm. right <laughs> don't do that and i was just talking with someone right before we hit record of we say satan is the prince of this world we talk about his allies aiding and participating in his cause to tear down creation to eliminate god altogether from our imagination mm -hmm. destroy faith destroy charity but then we never want to delve too deeply into the consequences of that statement. Or recognize as, the actual right. practice in our own life. Exactly. Our own and, deference right. to, his, to his ways and his works. Right. Which, if the entire mechanism of salvation is death and resurrection, that's what we're trying to avoid altogether. We want to control life and death while simultaneously avoiding conversation about objective death and resurrection. Which is why we are talking about theology of cross versus theology of glory. They're based, they're two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And if people would just read Luther, read the Heidelberg Disputation, the assertion is a theologian of glory is made through suffering and affliction. There is no such thing as a theology of glory, but rather the theology of glory as a theology is a negative theology. I'm sorry, theology of the cross is a negative theology of glory, because theologies assume. <laughs> that we have some choice in their formulation, in their expression, their confession, their teaching. It's like, this is like theories of atonement. And it's like, right. well, yeah. no, there's the atonement. Right. And the, the theories are seeking to describe some aspect Correct. of it, but they're, but they're not the totality of it. Right. Well, and as or, Nor are they like right and wrong. I mean, that's also Any another... Any theory like, that's intelligently presented to me, I will listen to and I will entertain it. But mm -hmm. it's still a theory, which means it's, it means that I'm open to accepting other better theories. It's a red Vers string thing, right? I mean, right. Versus a theologian yeah. of the cross is made passively through mm -hmm. suffering and affliction by the Holy Spirit who kills and makes alive. Involuntarily, want, right? Involuntarily. So we want a theology of the cross because it allows us, we think, time, space, choice, we have options. A theologian of the cross, like I was telling you, when you have new students who like to talk a lot about fighting, they like to watch videos about fighting, they they project their insecurities out as when are you just going to fight first versus yeah. when you've actually fought and you've actually yeah. been punched in the face and you've actually been choked out it's you don't talk about it in romantic terms and you don't idealize it anymore you simply treat it like i'm going to work and they don't understand that because they've not gone through it but once they go through it it shuts them up pretty quickly and mm -hmm. likewise the difference between being made a theologian versus adopting a theology of the cross which how many people do you and I know, including ourselves, who when we discovered the Heidelberg Disputation as an example, and we were enthralled by it and provoked by it, right? It, it, it again, it, we saw it as a paradigm for life, right? But then we became pastors, and we were crushed, and we were seasoned, and we were roasted on a spit by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit. And, and now Heidelberg that, describes ex our right. experience that was, right. like I said, involuntary, not yeah. chosen, right? Yeah. And, and, not, and not something we rejoiced in. Right. Hey, or, what do you or, think? Do you think I should become a pastor? No. <laughs> Why? Because God is going to crush you. Hmm. And I don't That's mean why. the come to church on Sunday sort of crushing. I mean, every day he's going to crush you with crosses. Yeah. This is, this is why, you know, I was just at a pastor conference and it's so, I'm so skeptical of somebody who comes with answers. Right, mm -hmm. who says here's here's what was successful for me, or you know, because that's glory. Right. But 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 it's even worse than that. Who clearly had a, had a good way of it, but didn't didn't see, isn't trying to like um, see how God worked through suffering and through pain. Right, rather is looking and saying, look at what I did. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there was no suffering and pain. It was like the people received it, which is what makes me all skeptical. It's like if look if they're mm -hmm. willingly receiving what you're doing. Right. Um, you probably are just giving them what they want, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily, I mean, maybe faith, but it might not be, right? So, right. How many I don't want to get too far into this topic. How many times you rejecting the truth? 
We should right. get too deep into this topic because it's actually what um, what's in the, our work for today. Good. Can you resend me that? Yeah, I can. I didn't download it last time. Why not? Should I, I don't try to know. message to it? It's so big. You know, try to message. Oh, you just send me a text. Send me Haman mm -hmm. text again. Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse Since me. we're and uh, looks well, like while he's getting that up, um, I'll just say uh, thank you to fifteen seventeen for providing us the opportunity to have this. We conversation. haven't started recording yet. Oh, that's true. We haven't done that either. <laughs> Don't go I'm, thinking stuff and going through the I process am so far here. Ahead of myself. Well, it's we got to do things in order. Was, well, I've started was stuttering yesterday. I started thinking about this: is that the video, which was just like immaterial at the beginning, we just kind of mm -hmm. just like whatever, might as well make it live. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's like fifteen percent of the audience now. So cool. That's fantastic. So that may, maybe we have to just, take it more you seriously. You sent me why membership matters. No, let's not. Be, let me send you something else. A study guide. I was like, why did it go so fast? No, it <laughs> explains it. Why membership matters. This is a really funny uh, workbook if you look at it. I will look at that later. <laughs> because, I mean, I do. I do believe it matters, but I don't think it's, it matters for the reasons you think it matters. <laughs> well, I, that's one that's far too organized for me. <laughs> that you have, have a booklet on that. Well, you know, I'm still dealing with that question of like, mm -hmm. I need to. I'm supposed to give this outline for school parents. It's like, here's how you become a member. Right. And it's like, well, you come to church, and then then we decide whether or not you want to be my. I want to be, or you want to be, a part of the a guild. part of this part of this congregation, and yeah. whether I can be your pastor. This right. is not that hard. Mm -hmm. It's like, do you agree with what we teach? I suppose mm -hmm. that's part of it too. But it's like that's part of that dance. In the abstract, a hundred percent. Come Sunday right, morning. Well, right. No, I mean, uh, I mean, small catechism, I guess. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you agree with this? Okay, fine. Right. We can work with that. Yeah. It's a good starting spot. And you probably don't even know that you, where you disagree with it anyway. Right. right. Even if we do it, it's going to take a while to send. I don't know what's going on here. Hmm. It's so big. It's so big. Hmm. It's going. It's still going. I know. We're going to go to the archipelago. Oh, I got it. XVI, the archipelago, the key metaphors right. and themes of the London writings, which has to do with biblical interpretation, how he reads mm -hmm. the Bible. Ralphie yeah. Darko. It is funny. We should answer. We should answer this. We send each other. Uh, did you is. start? Did you start recording? I did not yet. Uh, before no, we do that's that, the link to the actual book itself. No, I just no, sent I it to you as a PDF. I know. I have to wait. It's coming. It mm -hmm. it says delivered on my end. There we go. Click um, download. Downloading. Yeah, please download it. Who was, what was I going to say? D Fresh asks, what's the decent resource for language study of the Bible? <laughs> well, I mean, you need a theological dictionary, um, and you need the original languages. Yeah. Theological so if, word book of the Old Testament is two volumes. Yeah, that one's decent. That's decent. I'm looking. Lexicons, you know. Yeah. That's what you do, and you just look up words. You can get mm -hmm. an interlinear, if, even if you don't know original language. I always recommend getting a New King James interlinear, so you can kind yeah. of jump around and follow the trail. It's fun. Right, and then you can look and say, what's that word, and go see. Right. Like, yeah, I mean, you have to, you're going to have to learn the alphabets to be able to mm -hmm. kind of find it in the, in the workbook. Right. Then you can just search for words, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the TWOT, the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament, does a good job of... It gives you it gives you the definition and it gives you all of the references in the scriptures for that particular word, but also does right. a great job of giving you the context for the words so that unlike something like the Amplified Bible or Strong's Concordance, right. which just give you the words and then tell you this is it doesn't what it give means. you Aristotle or Plato or, right. or whoever. Whereas the theological word book at least explains like this is the context and why this word is used in this context. However, if we go to Isaiah, it's a different context, but same word. But now right. if we jump back to Genesis, so it gives you these these you know one to two page explanations for these particular words, and well, and it's and it's specifically uh, been created for that purpose. Yes, right? exactly. For for lazy pastors or for lay people, mm -hmm. I shouldn't Where say lazy pastors, we? incompetent, incapable. What do you do uh, today? X tell you were at a pastor's conference. You come back and you're all salty. Oh well, it makes me angry. So I come back a little bit. Uh, amped Why up. is this so short? Chronology, a real treasure. You have to go before the chronology. It's page 10. This is just the introduction. It's all Roman numerals. There's a, Yeah, that's all we're doing. Because the, the archipelago, XVI, which is mm -hmm. 
that it's just quotes about his from from the actual book. We're gonna use we're gonna use Kleinick's summary because otherwise, you'll you'll see why when you read it. So we read the Sage of the North. Mm-hmm. And now we're skipping down the orbit. Yeah, we're not gonna do that. Oh, there's the archipelago. All right, I got, got it. Yeah, good. Uh, okay. Yagu, Yagu beef. Okay, fine. So <laughs> now we can push record. Oh, I see. So organized. Are you doing it? I'm about to. All right, go. All right, I'm going. And then I'm going to play a war chant. Let's see if it's the right volume. Let's make it really loud today. Okay. Ready? Put it on the <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number 250. We are your hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Chillin' and willin', maxin' and relaxin'. I'm Don Riley. You're linked up, I'm linked up. We are I'm amped up. Amped oh, you're up. amped up. Look at you go. Caffeinated. I feel good too. This is going to be a lively one, I think. Um, it's 250. 250. This is momentous, two. isn't it? Sure. May the I mean, fifth be with you. Anyway. It's about as significant a milestone as, like, say, I don't know, confirmation in the church. Mm -hmm. For us, it's a major milestone because I don't think you and I are capable of actually doing anything 250 times without getting bored and moving on. This is the longest. This is the longest running show we've ever done. It is. That's true. By a long shot. Right. So, to that point, then, thank you to 1517 for allowing us the opportunity to have the conversation and supporting us. And so, we hope that you go and support 1517 and all they do there. Check right. out Register book, for the fall conference. Conference in October. I uh, got a new book, Weather Tongue Emails. It's out now. New copies are available on Amazon now. It's sold out. And go listen got, to the other podcasts on the 1517 Podcast Network. There we go. Do you have any Outlaw recommendations? Outlaw God in particular is fun. There it is. All right. I saw that coming. See. I know. Uh, let's see. What else? Oh, thanks to our listeners, obviously. Uh, for we feedback. got a lot of feedback on the mm -hmm. last episode. Where I asked the question about whether you want, you know, which direction you want the conversation to go, and we got a lot of feedback uh, to let us know. Yeah, shut up, stop asking questions, and keep doing what you're doing. So it was interesting because you know I, we know that we're a little bit uh, rando sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> right? And then the cultural context stuff is interesting. It, but it, we were talking about that with the message last episode, right? The message. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, the, and trans, the paraphrase or translation. The paraphrase, language, right, right. Mm -hmm. right. But you can't, you can't teach without um, that doing that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And bringing in kind of references. Like yesterday, I was right. talking talking with someone about how you know the attacks on the created order, mm -hmm. right? Which is an attack on God's word, which constitutes Correct. the created order, right? right? Exactly. He speaks and brings things into being, mm -hmm. and I'm like, and here's examples. Like it, it's interest, it's an interesting theme. You've got it like in Tolkien with the orcs, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of a transhumanist thing, right? Yeah, right. Um, and then you have it with Lewis as well. I was trying to think. No, but then the one that was interesting that came up, not Lewis, was Stephen King um, mm -hmm. in the Dark Tower series. Yeah, absolutely. The um, the, the demon creatures, um, yeah. they're wearing like these human skins, mm -hmm. but if they're not if they're not conscientious of it, you can see where this where it stretches it weird and yeah, and where it slips. Yeah, you see that all over the place nowadays. If you watch. <laughs> uh, I know, and it makes me wonder about Stephen King a lot mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of uh, some of the things seem to get way too close to the demonic for me. It makes yeah. me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's like, are you actually like, in a sense, communicating or communing with the sure to be able to talk about things? I mean, because mm -hmm. that the I think the last book of the Dark Tower, I can't remember what it's called. I think that was written like twenty, maybe more years ago. But then, like Tolkien is mm -hmm. doing that with the orcs, and that's right. 50, no, 70 well, years ago now? Well, Tolkien experienced the demonic in World War One. Yeah, so he came face to face with it. And really, if you if you watch the movies, and you watch the depiction of um, Isengard, and... You Which do, are the, the elven orcs, right? Right, is that if you, if you notice by the Twin Towers, the land and everything around it, it looks an awful lot like the... the oh, he's definitely an anti-industrialist. <laughs> right. But it, it looks like the no man's land pictures from World War mm -hmm. One. Yeah. Like the Battle just of the Sand and Just so strip forth mined and, and yeah. everything. Yeah. It's, it's just decimated. And obviously since he lived through that and it left a permanent scar in his imagination, then writing about the orcs and even in Princess Mononoke you see this, which is obviously oh, yeah. an anti-industrialization story too. Yeah. Blatant is what are the consequences and it is a destruction of creation but then a destruction of the things within that creation which are good 
Well, and, and I and I disagree with the films, Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. films, because um, in the last, uh, in the last, when when they go back to the Shire and they find mm -hmm. out that that's where Saruman ended up, right? And he had like industri he just yeah, turned he it industrialized, he'd the done Shire. the same thing yeah. to the Shire, yeah. But they left that out because I guess they wanted to be more hopeful, mm -hmm. but that's like no, I mean the mm -hmm. evil keeps it's just going to find right. another place to take yeah. root, well, and you left that unguarded. Yeah. I mean, well, that was when I was little. You were and I were little. They would have the specials on TV at different times of the year, and they were usually done like Chuck Jones, but you had Charlie Brown specials, you had the Christmas specials, the old um, um, stop Frosty. motion stuff, but yeah. then you also, and the Frosty Snowman cartoons, but you also had uh, Dr. Seuss specials. And the one that always, that left a permanent scar in my imagination was the Lorax. Of course, yeah. Because there's almost no hope in that cartoon. Even at the end, you get the one little sprout, but that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's and devastating. It's a very hopeless parable, so to speak. And like we talked about before, we hit the audio recording. We we don't take seriously enough in the churches, in my opinion, the consequences of Satan being the prince of this world and his allies actively, well, actually gladly participating in his schemes and his regime. So we say it, we confess it, but under but other we, names and disguises mm -hmm. and whatnot. Right, that's my point, you know, back to the Stephen King reference. We we confess it, we talk about it in the abstract, but then when we drill down into the specifics of it, like the demonic, we get, well, some people well, get very yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, did you see, like, Elizabeth Warren out mm -hmm. in front of the Supreme yeah. Court? Yeah, it was like, like a woman she's possessed. She's possessed. She's yeah. possessed. Right. Yeah, you do, clearly. Because you don't, you don't lose all emotional control like that, mm -hmm. and you don't rant like that. Right. Unless you've been overtaken, especially when you by... know that the actual context of what you're saying isn't true, right? That's that's the that's the. She knows uh, the actual law. She knows what's actually happening. It's all well, she fear. knows. Well, she calls it a law. It's not even a law, right? It was a legal ruling, but there was right, no law exactly. passed in Congress. No, no, it's all theater. Right. But, like you said, don't she pay believes her to own the theatrics. Uh... Look in the eyes. <laughs> yeah. Look at the look at the behavior and go. Her eyebrows, in her case. Yeah. Exactly. So you see it over and over again, but mm -hmm. the Christian churches apparently are afraid to acknowledge it in a way that when you read the scriptures, we, we know his, as historians of God's word, what happens when you choose to willfully ignore the demonic when it's amongst you, when it's in your right. face. Well, and I think that's the worst is when you, when, I mean, we've both seen this in mm -hmm. parishes, in a congregation, yeah, right? And, um, and it's worse. Mm-hmm. Because because it has that that false pretense is even right. more dramatic. It's like mm -hmm. I'm a Christian, right? Well, it's dressed you know? up as godliness, exactly. Right, right. It's one I mean, thing the appearance to say of godliness, right? Billy Eilish is a Luciferian, even though she. <laughs> or what was the one where they're drinking each it. other's blood? Who was that? Oh, that was Megan, Megan Fox, Fox and um, Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah. Like you said the secret thing out loud. You need to not do that. Yeah, what I mean, they're like I'm sure you do these vampiric ri right, rituals. It's, yeah, it's we well, expected it from you. It's recorded. It's it's a precedent. It goes all the mm -hmm. way back to the 20s in Hollywood. Um, but then Thank when you, it takes Alistair place. Crowley. Well, then, it, yeah, well, him and Anton LaVey later, too. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but you look at then in the parishes, like you noted, it doesn't disguise itself as celebrity or as theater in the case of the Travis Scott concert in Texas. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Rather, it presents itself as godliness, which, as I reminded someone the other day, Lucifer always appears as an angel of light. He comes talking like Gabriel. And that's what makes it so appealing. Because as I thought about, what Satan is doing is essentially saying, listen, I was thrown out of heaven. I fell from heaven. And if you want to get into heaven, you need to be good sheep. You don't want to be a bad sheep. So in a way, Satan, again, is saying, from my own experience, I'm warning you not to do what I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then at the end, yeah. twisting it and saying, so if you don't want to end up being kicked out of heaven, like I got kicked out, you need to be obedient. Right. Well, and I think... I think Maybe the worst, it's not just the worst kind of deceit, but it's mm -hmm. the most, maybe tempting, is uh, that those who actually know the truth, mm -hmm. right? And then who distort the truth. Right. Not those who are acting in ignorance. Well, who right? are labeled just, extremists. Yeah. Truth tellers. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Right. Because they know, they know, they know, they mm know. -hmm. It's like, they, and they, they know how to manipulate either God's word or right. the truth in a kind of an abstract sense yeah. for their purpose. Right. 
which makes it even, I don't know if it's more evil, but it's certainly, uh, right. it's more deceiving, <clears throat> right? Because it has that appearance of godliness, like you said. When you read the Lutheran Large Catechism as an example, especially the Lord's Prayer and the petitions, Dr. Luther delves deeply into sin, the world, and Satan, deeply, in every petition. It's mm -hmm, remarkable. Right. Yeah. And the response from my folks when we read this is, I don't remember ever reading this. I don't remember from confirmation, I don't remember from other studies of this ever reading this stuff. And I said, yeah, because you don't ever talk about it, and therefore it gets memory hold. You learn it, it's provocative, and then you move on, and it's forgotten. Well, Whereas, yeah. If you take his um, even small catechism directive mm -hmm. to to examine yourself according to the Ten Commandments, and you mm -hmm. actually do it, mm -hmm. like in the way of, uh, we've mentioned Ken Corby's theses before, his, yeah. his questions and answers, mm -hmm. Uh, you're devastated. Right. Like if you actually take the commandments seriously and bring in mm -hmm. the witness of Scripture right. to bear on each of them, mm -hmm. like it's not just like you don't make it to the second question, which is also <laughs> right. true. Yeah. Right? You get hung up on the first commandment and you don't yeah. even get to the second commandment. It's but, like you hit, you think you hit a grand slam home run, but it's just a dribble down the third baseline, and then you trip over your own foot on the way to first base, go <laughs> face down in the dirt, and by the time you're looking up, he's just standing over you with the ball going, you're out. Well, it's kind of like you, you took the swing, you thought you hit it mm -hmm. out of the park, right? you start running to first base, mm -hmm. you're, you're smiling, you're cheering, and everybody yeah. else is like... Right. It's, yeah. Run faster. <laughs> did, you, did you see that you just, you didn't even foul it off? You just, it right. was a total, it was yeah. a total yeah. mixed metaphor, air ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I, air know, ball. I know we're using baseball, but whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to mix it up. Can't always talk about Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai. <laughs> So right. that being well, said, how did we then, get on this topic? I forget. Yeah, what started talking. this off? Just okay. talking. All right, we're talking about so scripture. So the point That's is, take the about. unholy trinity more seriously, because Christ overcomes sin, death, and the devil. So dig. Yeah. In faith, you have nothing to fear. Outside of God's word in Christ, God Himself, as I preached last week, outside of His word, outside of Christ, God is killing you. Yeah. Because you're sinful, and He can't tolerate it. It's not you that he's got a problem with, it's sin that's in you. And since it's inseparable, he's got to figure out a way to get you separated from sin, and the only way to do that is to kill you, therefore you're not sinning anymore, and to raise you from the dead, which kills death in the same, in the same stroke, and ultimately then Satan can't have you for his kingdom because God translates you out of Satan's kingdom through death into an eternal kingdom, which is Christ. But I think where we stumble, and we'll get into this with Haman, I think, the resurrection is not a thing. It's a person. Mm. Right. And death and sin and Satan, these aren't things. They are manifest physically. They are persons. And therefore, we treat them as abstractions. But as I've said before, by treating them as abstractions, we end up treating Jesus as an abstraction. We treat Abraham and Isaac as an abstraction. We treat everything as an abstraction. Ah, uh, so you, maybe you say it this way: If the enemies of Christ are are impersonal sure. ideas, then right. Christ just becomes an idea. It's the well, Christ consciousness right. or whatever, then right? What What is the church but a Don Quixote that tilts at windmills, calling them dragons? What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're just we, and then we should look like maniacs to normal people because we are. I well, I always ask this question, and it makes people so uncomfortable, which is part of the reason why I ask it. Mm. Um, because I like to make people uncomfortable, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it's just simply, why are you here? Right. Like, what's or what's the point? Mm -hmm. Why do we do what we do? Mm -hmm. You know, why why continue? Yeah. You know, what's the well? Right. Uh, you know, is it ha it does it have any kind of you know short term, long term value? I mean, it has and temporary why not? value, mm -hmm. personal temporary value, emotional value, long term. I'm gonna get bored. Right, and why is that? <clears throat> Because there's no truth to what it is. It's my truth and what I'm getting from this. What I need to take from this, what I want to take from this, what I crave, I need this right now. But then when I get bored with that, I'm going to move on to the next thing that satisfies and the next and the next. Hmm. I mean, I know I someone we, who started off life we... as a devout Roman Catholic, became a Lutheran, from a Lutheran became a life coach and talks about talking to the universe all the time. <sighs> Okay. It's like, how did you get there? It's like, well, because I was never satisfied at a certain point, and therefore I just kept moving on to the next thing. But how does the does the universe answer? No, of course not. You're just talking to yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's like the prophets of Baal, right? At, at, yeah. Uh, at Carmel, like, what? Right. 
Why aren't they listening? Yes, it is. Uh, Paul they were... on live stream asks, is that the difference between deliver us from evil and deliver us from the evil one? And the answer is yes. It is. In okay, Hebrew, I... there's no such thing as evil as an abstract concept. It's always I can't find I can't find the Ken Corby questions for Confession Absolution, but I found the, the mm -hmm. lectures. They're yeah. available for free from the Siberians. You have to mm -hmm. pay for them from other people, but from the Siberians are giving mm -hmm. away for free. Yay, Russia. Right. I got them and on then, my desktop if you ever want them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, there's a link. You can just download yeah. it, and then I'll put it in the show notes. Also, we did a, we did a Ken Corby episode. Yeah, we did. Yep. We were talking about Confession Absolution. Whenever yeah, the gospel is spoken, one must also talk about moderation and suffering with joy, mm -hmm. is what it was called. So right. link to that as well. Good. You'll see it in the notes. But yeah, if you read the Psalms, for example, uh, that you know, evil can't stand in the congregation of the righteous. That's not what it says. That's not, that's <laughs> not it. What it says is that the evil man, the evil one, cannot stand in the congregation of righteous people. Right. Righteousness well, is as if thing. it's like a black cloud or something. Right, exactly. No. I've seen the, people that have black clouds hovering over them. Sure. But they're still people. Right. That's why when people ask, well, how can you read Jesus into the Psalms? I'm not reading him into the Psalms. He's right there, the righteous one. It's, it's a proper noun. It's, it's very specific, the righteous one. It's singular. Other times, the psalmist says the righteous ones, the righteous people, plural. Mm -hmm. But when you don't translate that and you just take the pronoun out, which is ironic in a time that we're obsessed with pronouns in this culture, but you take the pronoun out, you've completely sent, you've scrubbed Jesus from the text. And then when you get to the New Testament and Jesus quotes Psalms and says, that's about me, you're like, but where? He's like, that's because you took the pronouns out. Yeah, right. So yeah, it does matter. <laughs> that being said, then. Now we can get there. We're going to continue with Ham on here and the key metaphors and themes of the London writings. If you didn't hear the introduction that we uh, did, you go back and Two, listen to the previous. 249. 249. Now let's dive into it. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Haman is not a systematic thinker, nor does he privilege systematic thought with its abstractions as a superior kind of knowledge. He is, if you like, not concerned with the big picture. The big picture that is provided by comprehensive theory or a geometrical model or an encyclopedia, but with little pictures full of particular relevant details that are perceived by the eyes and discerned by the imagination. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yet what he says does have an intricate organic coherence, like the apparent disorder in the natural world. Thus, what he says about the scriptures also applies to what he has written. Quote, all methods of interpretation should be regarded as the hand carts of reason and its crutches. The imagination of a poet has a thread that is invisible to the common eye and appears to be a masterpiece to experts. All hidden artifice is governed by the nature of the imagination. In this respect, sacred scripture is the best example and finest touchstone for all human criticism. That's nice. Yeah, and we've been talking about this, uh, you know, approach. And really, I mean, the way that I've tried to encourage people to delight in the scriptures, mm -hmm. it's connected to this this idea yeah. of imagination, right? Or, you know, the use of the imagination. It's not an idea, mm -hmm. it's a gift. So I mean, you just read and, and say, not what does the scripture means to me, but like start to do the, mm -hmm. do the uh, pattern recognition like we've right. talked about, right? right? Make the connections, say, hey, there's three days here, is there three mm -hmm. days elsewhere? Right? Right. Maybe there's a coherence or maybe there isn't, right? I mean, the, mm -hmm. uh, and what I like about what he's saying Haman does is he just reads the Bible and he, t and he thinks about right. it. Right, right. Right? And then, but he's not trying to do, we bemoaned the systematizers, I think, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but but in a way, it's it's like the difference between just reading the Bible and then reading the catechism and thinking right. you've read the Bible. Yes, sure. You know, the catechism provides a framework or a skeleton kind mm -hmm. of architecture for you to, mm -hmm. to approach right. it, I think rightly, mm -hmm. right? And we don't want to get rid of it. But on the other hand, it's not the Bible right. itself, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to learn anything of, right. you know, the history of the kings from the catechism, right, right, right. you know, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it also goes to the point that we're talking about is what you're doing, well, you're doing twofold work when you, whenever you read the Bible, whether you're translating it or just reading it for devotional purposes or studying mm -hmm. it, you're doing something in a twofold manner. One, the old Adam is attempting to overstand the Bible <laughs> and the new yes. man in Christ is attempting to understand the Bible and place mm -hmm. himself under God's word. And so there's always going to be this tension of 
this is what it means to me, to your point. The old Adam right. is always it's asking the question, well, if I translate it this way, does it agree with my presuppositions? No. Well, how can I make it? Well, I know. I'll just translate all the other datives in the same way. Yeah. Or is it, okay, this doesn't agree with my, what I want it to say or what I believe it says. However, if I look at this word in other um, passages of the scripture, what does it tell me about how this word is used colloquially in Israel or by the New Testament authors who are drawing upon these texts? Right, right. And yeah. it doesn't matter what English translation you have, the editors of that Bible have done great violence to the text in order to wring out of it a translation. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. That's why Jesus himself says, actually, that you know the violent take the kingdom of heaven by force. But yet simultaneously, the new man in Christ, as I noted, is asking and prayerfully saying to God, please conform me to your word. Yeah. I was thinking of... Uh, yeah. I was thinking of uh, the, you know the criticism of Rome of Luther of mm -hmm. of the addition quote unquote of the align mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. adding that exclusive particle yeah. uh, alone mm -hmm. um, you know and then it, it, just the irony of it all because Rome is mm -hmm. relying upon Jerome's Vulgate which yeah. also as we've noted on many episodes in the past yeah. did great violence to the text mm -hmm. like do penance yeah. right rather right. than repent yeah yeah so it's inevitable but I would say this pastorally because my congregation brings this up, especially new members, back to your original point about that. New members come to my Bible study and they're just shredded by the way in which I'm engaging the text, which is to criticize the translation of the text when I think it's a bad translation. And But I go to great lengths then to explain why I think it's a bad translation and why I think this is a better translation based on the whole of Scripture. Well, if you've been taught your whole life that the Bible, you read it and then what it means to you is really the point of reading the Bible, you're asking yourself, what does this mean to me? It's like I said in the sermon last week. When you hear a parable, you hear Jesus' parable, the old Adam automatically asks the question, where do I fit in this parable? Where am yeah. I in the parable? Which am character? I the, yeah, am which I character? the sheep? Am I the shepherd? Am I the hired hand? Am I the wolf? I don't know. And Jesus just says, point blank after he speaks the parable, I will tell you who you are. I will tell you where you fit, and I will tell you what this means to you. Right. And yet you notice all of the disciples... When he tells parables, after the fact, when they're alone, explain it to us. Yeah, could you explain that to us? Because I don't. Because Jesus says, "Those who are in understand, and those who are out don't." And then the disciples, who you assume are in, seeing they do not see and hearing they don't. They do not yeah, hear. seeing they don't, yeah. they're like, yeah, we don't get a thing that you're talking about. Can you explain it to us? To you, it has been given, and I think yeah. that's the key. To you, it's been yeah. given to understand, right? Because you see this at the end of Luke's gospel. And it's really mm -hmm. remarkable. He does it in a couple ways. He's got the. The, the road to Emmaus, right, where mm -hmm. he opens their eyes uh, right. with the breaking of the bread and mm -hmm. and, and, the, and in the catechetical instruction, right? right? right. But um, at the very end, it's like um, right before he ascends into heaven, he says, you know, from Moses or from the law of Moses, from the mm -hmm. prophets and the Psalms, and then he opened their understanding so that they might comprehend the scriptures. Right. You're like, right. well, wait a minute. These, I mean, these these guys have been with him for three years, and they do mm -hmm. not yet, they still do not understand yeah, not that it's thing. necessary right. that the Christ suffer yeah. and die and on the third day rise, right? right? And, and he had, so, I mean, and this is still true. This is the point. This is still mm -hmm. true for us today. He yeah. has to open our understanding so that we might comprehend. If he doesn't open it, by the way of the spirit, mm -hmm. there's no understanding. There's no comprehension. Right. You just and look at then, it as this like crazy book about crazy people. Right. You know, another, right. well, I mean, it sounds real because it still sounds like, like the kind of things we might experience in real life. Except the first five books of the Bible. <laughs> uh, and Daniel and Ezekiel and Joshua, and, Joshua yeah, and, and all the prophets. Oh, wait a minute. Well, yeah. and the other point, the psalmist even makes this point repeatedly. Sing to the Lord right. a new song. It's like, this is not a song that you're going to sing unless it's right. given to you to sing. We've, we've talked about before, but the greatest expression, in my opinion, of what happens when the old Adam gets a hold of God's word is Thomas Jefferson's Bible. <laughs> he just took an exacto. I want to get a copy of it just so I can yeah. show people. Look yeah. at it. Now, because I describe it to them, and yeah. they're like, no, he didn't do that. I'm like, no, we, yeah. there's the physical copy in the National Archives, yeah. right? Yeah. You can see it. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> but that's what we do. We, we carve it up because we don't like what it says. It, it yeah. defies our education. It defies our culture, uh, the zeitgeist. It defies reason. As well, we let's, answer, reason. let's answer a, a listener question from a long mm -hmm. time ago, because I have an answer now. I finally have one. Oh, all right. There you go. Which is, uh, it was the question about, about Hebrews 6, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever has fallen, you know, cannot yeah, be right. again restored. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, my presenter yesterday uh, just pointed out that the, uh, the text of the day for that day was Deuteronomy 31. Nice. 
uh, and Moses is is preaching about um, about the wilderness, and it's referring to those who died in the wilderness and never entered into the promised rest. Yeah, they're like, oh, wait a minute, the Bible does say that, and then look, mm-hmm. who falls from faith can't be restored again. Right, like, that actually happened in real yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Um, so our problem with that text, of course, is we don't like it. Right. We don't like the idea that like there were, well, the whole host of Israel who yeah. were born in Egypt, right. didn't enter the enter physically into the promised <coughs> rest. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Is that a threat? Yeah, that's a pretty big threat. It's a big. But threat, that's actually yeah. the story. That's it. It's but, it. but God loves me, and and He just wants me to be happy, and mm-hmm. and He would never drive anyone out, um, except in the book of Deuteronomy. In which he they, makes you walk in circles until you all drop dead. Yeah, never mind the serpents. And yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh, twenty thousand died that day. I thought yeah. those were God's people. Yeah, uh, yeah, they were. Were past tense, maybe. Right. He gave them over to the desires of their heart. You know, so if, you just, if you demand long enough, God will give you what you want. Let's cut. I'm going to cut that part out of my Bible. I'm sorry. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. <laughs> But to your point, to, to segue back in, even mm-hmm. after they receive the Holy Spirit, even after Jesus opens their minds so that they can see, yeah. what's the first thing they do? They argue with each other about the message. Like immediately following Pentecost, there's oh, yeah. an argument. They just constantly well, argue with each other. All the way through to Acts 15 yeah. to the council, and even Peter after that. Peter rejects the call of the Holy Spirit to go to Cornelius. Not once, not twice, yeah. but thrice. He has to be right. forced to go. Right. Oh, so there's no such, we talked about this with the Romans in the growthy text, right? That, well, this is pre-conversion Paul and post-conversion Paul. One, grammatically, no. Two, experience proves that that's not true. Because I confess that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. I can't say that according to Paul unless I have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have the Holy Spirit. However, I'm still constantly doing violence to the text, regardless of that confession. Did you know that they distributed the Jefferson Bible to every sitting senator every year until 1950? No kidding. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Huh. Does that say from 1820 till 1950, every senator got a copy, a new copy every year? Hmm. You want to talk the about morals, a war against God. The life and morals of Jesus. There you go. There is, there is a... Did that affect... That might have affected things a little bit. Yeah. You think that whole city on a hill moral authority thing uh-huh uh-huh yeah you can wow. read it online you don't have to download a copy there's facsimile yeah. online so nice. I'll, I'll link it up so we cannot therefore discover the big picture that haman sees apart from its partial disclosure in the little pictures that he paints for us haman once noted that the things which he had written were like islands in an archipelago the gulag archipelago <laughs> Even though he was, as a writer, did not build bridges to take us from one thought to another, we must nevertheless presuppose that they have an invisible connection, hidden, as it were, under the sea. You know what? We're going to steal that and use that as a description of this podcast in perpetuity. That's us in a nutshell. <laughs> there, the, you can presuppose that there is an invisible connection, but it's hidden. <laughs> it's hidden. <laughs> like, those, like those undersea cables. Right. You just hope they don't get snipped. That's right. Dude, what do you guys do on your podcast? Well, you have to understand... <laughs> It's, it's not that we build bridges to take you from one of our thoughts to another. It's just that we presuppose there's an invisible connection hidden under the sea, as it were. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? It means we what do you guys know. really think about this? Right. Mm-hmm. Just keep ah. listening. Yeah. <laughs> eventually. <laughs> yep. We're like a coon hound. We'll, we'll find the right tree eventually. Yeah. So as readers, we need our own mental bridges between them by ascertaining how they belong together and why. So... Like the editor of the collection of sayings in the book of Proverbs, he does not tell us what to think, but makes us think about something critically, constructively, and practically within a given frame of reference. Haman, somewhat ironically, referred to his London writings as Geshemir. Oh, oh, Geshmir, sorry, Geshmir. Mm -hmm. This unflattering German term combines three pictures, the scribbled scrawling of an unpracticed writer, the daubing of paint by an apprentice painter on a canvas, and the greasing of the wheels of a carriage or a cart to make it run more smoothly, which that's the most German thing that you can do, is just take a word, mash it together, and go, it actually means a whole bunch of stuff. It could mean any of these things. Yeah, or none. 
But yeah, Gesh Meyer or Gesh Meir, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I think it's Geshmir, yeah. Yeah, it's Geshmir in the old. This unflattering German term combines then these three pictures, scribbling, daubing paint, greasing the wheels, basically just something done, what, when you want to say, quickly, sloppily. Well, practically, though. It's practically, practical. though, right? It's, it's like, practicing. I, just, I need to do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. The image that is most revealing for me is of Haman as a painter. In the London writings, he uses words to paint a picture of his impressions so that we not only see what he sees, but also see as he sees. But that requires a discerning eye and a sharp mind with an enlightened imagination, which... Which is why we're using Kleinig's summary yeah. rather than actually going and reading the actual text. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We'll let him do all the hard work here. Exactly. I was taught this by my Greek professor. I've talked about it, I think, on this show before, where he, my Greek professor said, never use a word when 10 will do. Meaning, don't just talk to the congregation, paint a picture with words for them. And this You're is not talking that, about like an abundance of words just to no, fill the page. No. You're saying, like, put the, put the right. meat on the skeleton. I talked about it in the sermon. I said, Jesus is scalding the Pharisees. And then I explained, scalding? Scalding. If you've ever gone in the kitchen, boiled something on the stove, and then thrown it in someone's face, you've scalded them. Well, that picture now is etched in your image as I continue then coming back to the theme of Jesus scalding the Pharisees. There's probably He's actually like an ancient rhetorical technique name for yeah, that. Absolutely. I'm sure. But know. my congregation doesn't understand ancient rhetorical techniques. It doesn't they matter. Do understand they can appreciate what the artistry of it. Scalded by water or something. So right. then, whenever I bring that word back up throughout the sermon, there's that image of Jesus throwing his words in their face like boiling hot water. So then when they react negatively to Jesus and they argue with Jesus, oh, if someone threw boiling hot water on me, I would be mad. Like, I, would be I haven't even healed that. from the last time you did it. Exactly. Right. And I think that's what often happens in our preaching when we don't pay attention is that we simply get up, do our job, and sit down. But the flip side to your point is, we become so flowery, flowery with words that we lose our listeners because they're saying, like, you've strung together so many metaphors and so many analogies. What was the original gospel lesson again? I don't remember what you were talking or, about. Or, I mean, I think even worse than that, and, I, you know, this is, this is a, you know, new pre preacher, <laughs> I mm -hmm. think, uh, is is using long formulations yes. and, and just repeating those long formulations. Yeah. And some of those are helpful, you know, as far as for, <coughs> for memory, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if they're not creative and they're not unique, you know, right. then, then not so much. But like, um, oh, who is a common preacher that uses these kind of things? Uh, that we Oh, Coleman does this, right? Brent Coleman. Yeah, yeah, Brent Coleman. Where he right. has his like formulations, but they're unique to him. Uh -huh. So it's kind of, and he's, and he's filled them with meaning, you know, with the congregation. So they, they understand, okay, this is shorthand for right. that whole idea yes. that he preached to it. He's preached to us like five times about right. in the last year. Right. right? And so then he can build yeah. upon that. But he, he has a great point a kind of, is that you actually, yeah. as a preacher, have the opportunity to build a language mm -hmm. for your congregation. And then when a visitor comes and says, who's this Adam guy he keeps referring to in the sermon? It's like the old Adam, right. you know, sinners. And they're like, oh, sinners. It's like, yeah, he's just using that as shorthand to describe us. Mm -hmm. But if you don't yeah. know that, if you're not a part of the conversation. Right. And the shorthand right. is usually inept. You know, it doesn't yeah. really do a, it's a good job. It's a or a greasing of the wheels. Right. But but I think, uh, you know, to this point of like saying, well, I've read that this is what he's doing. He's reading his Bible and then he's saying, then he's, yeah. he's just thinking about it and he's writing down just brando ideas. Right. Where does this, where does my imagination take me when I hear this? And, you know, theologically. For those right? who don't want to go back and listen to the previous episode, he wasn't an academic. He wasn't in the institution. He wasn't a member of the guild. He was destitute in London. Not professionally. He right. was a tutor. Yeah. He was a tutor. So, when he's writing in his diaries, when he's thinking about these things, it's not like he's preparing them for our lectures. He's not preparing to teach them to a seminar. He's not going to get mm -hmm. in the pulpit and be preaching. These are his and and whoever he encounters in conversation throughout the day, maybe his students. It's his kind tutor, of weird that they tutors. saved them, you know? Yeah, but it's, you know, he's not standing before a, a symposium of hundreds of people. And no one's publishing these things in the newspaper or in books or anything like that. It's just him having a conversation with himself, with, with God, and then with a small group of people. Is that, is that within, I don't think that's within many Lutheran um, people's practice. I know it's, it's kind of popular among evangelicals to have like mm -hmm. a journaling Bible, right? Or a yeah. journal that you run next to yeah. it. And you just write down your ideas and your thoughts. Right. 
But but actually, no, that isn't. I now I'm wrong about that because we have the the Missouri Synod actually owns the original you know Bible from Johann Sebastian Bach, mm -hmm. his personal Bible, right. and his, the margin notes are just full. Yeah. Scrolled, of it, yeah. from his conversation with his pastor or his mm -hmm. own personal meditations yeah. as he's looking at these mm -hmm. at these texts to to then write music upon mm -hmm. right yeah so i mean there must be a tradition of that and we've just kind of lost, lost it. it yeah can you you can buy like like double spaced mm -hmm. with large margin yeah. yep. versions yeah. of books so you can do mm -hmm. that yeah you i think you can even get time. ones like with greek and hebrew you can yeah i have a greek hebrew bible that has really wide margins hmm. okay yeah so that's is kind it, of what this is that's what this is yeah yeah. Since Haman is not an abstract, systematic philosopher, but an intuitive and logical thinker, it would be unhelpful and presumptuous of me to isolate some ideas and themes from the exuberant abundance of thoughts and pictures on many different topics in the London writings, as if they were the key to understanding them. Instead of doing that, I shall highlight four key biblical metaphors and analogies that govern what he says in his written meditations on the Bible and his life as a Christian. Okay, good. The first metaphor, the picture of God as an author, the writer of a story. Since he, God, is the creator of heaven and earth, he is not just one of many authors, but the only true author, which many moons ago we talked about Jordan Peterson talking about this, that the That's Bible right. is the Ur text for all of Western literature, and really yeah. for all of literature in general in the whole world. This is why the statement in, in uh, uh, is it Hebrews, right? Mm -hmm. The author and perfecter of faith is yeah. so remarkable to say that Jesus is the yeah. author. Yeah. Well, that's why I got the term from Stephen Paulson that God, Jesus translates us into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, literally. yeah, there you go. Yeah. He literally authors us in. He rewrites us. He writes us into the book of life. Yeah. Hmm. Since he is the creator of heaven and earth, then he's just not, he is the only true author. He is the author of two great books, the book of nature, which includes the book of history. Oof. And his own book, the Bible, the book of God. Here's the thing then. That's I'm according not, to Haman. I'm not, right. I'm not letting this one pass. <laughs> this means then, if we use, if we accept Haman's argument, and I do, uh, natural law argument, but also right. notice he says the book of history. That means he that- He includes all, that in the book of nature. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Which means that all of human history on our side of the house is a, 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 battle a war to negate and deny god as creator mm -hmm. yeah. in all things historical not just in quote unquote nature as a 19th century theologian or philosopher understands nature even something like a roman myth but even exactly that's mm -hmm. what we're saying right is that all tales of brave knights fighting dragons is a continuation of the original confrontation between God and this and the dragon. Oh, we can defeat tree. the if we can defeat the serpent, but we don't need God to do it for us. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I haven't thought of that. That's yeah. great. Right. It's like the, no, the promise is the offspring of Eve that's going to crush the serpent's head. Right. Not you. Right. Exactly. Huh. And yes. Because uh. especially in the old Norse myths as an example, the gods choose their champions. Or they're descended in Greek myth, they're descended from gods. They're half gods. Or they're a quarter god. And that's why they're like Achilles. Achilles is a real person. He was arguably historically a real warrior, but then he was made into a descendant of the goddess and therefore he is not human. Right. But notice then what that allows. It allows for us to not have a Christ because we have Achilles. We get to be the actors in our own story. Exactly. exactly. Or the, no, the heroes of our own story. Or the heroes of the story. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And notice that every great hero and myth lo wins by losing, which everyone should know because that's Jesus. He, he wins by losing. Achilles wins, but he also loses because of, you know, his mom holding on too tight. <laughs> mm -hmm. or, or Siegfried or Beowulf or whoever it might be. Yeah. They win by losing. They become legends. They become heroes by losing. But yet their sacrifice wins for us peace and freedom from the dragon from the gods, from Loki, mm -hmm. whoever it might be. It's just an inversion of the original promise because we need to be the author of our own destiny. So, yeah, it's not just that we're trying to undo the Bible. 
and God's Word, we're attempting to undo nature itself and all of history, which is authored by God. We can't not. So, continuing on, while God is this anonymous author of the first book, he puts his name to the second book, even though he co-authors uh, yeah. with certain chosen human writers who write it under the inspiration of his Holy Spirit. It is therefore also the book of the Spirit, for he is the Spirit of this Word, who is Jesus. Since these two books tell the same story from two different points of view, they do not contradict each other. Ooh. Right. And there it is. As a Christian, right. if we take Haman's argument, you cannot have a positivistic outlook on human history or our interpretation of nature, which includes the sciences, by the way. Right. Which... I mean, there's all sorts of implications to this. Yes, there is. It's enormous. Oh, I see what happened here. My internet's dropping. Yeah, your internet's dropping in and out. So he is not just the spirit of the word. He is not just the inspiration for those who wrote the books that became our Bible. But he's also the same spirit who guides outside of God's promise, outside of Christ. He also authors and governs nature and history. Something to think about as, as you uh, not only read the Bible, but also engage at home or at work or at school or in your community with these questions. What's really happening? Well, we're at war with God. And with the help of sin, death, and Satan, our whole project in life actually is to reverse engineer creation, like I said at the beginning of the podcast about the original temptation, to close Eve's womb so that we close the future. We basically undo creation. We can no longer fulfill God's promise on earth to, to be fruitful and multiply because we've undone that. And that's our entire project. So when someone says, like a comedian says, I don't think that we're from this world originally because... If we were, we wouldn't try and destroy it so often, so actively. No, what you're missing is we're trying to destroy the earth because we're, well, we call it the earth instead of creation. And we call each other human beings instead of creatures. And we talk about accidents and we talk about fate and destiny and chance and luck instead of talking about God's promise and election because it just, we grammatically scrub God off the record. And in that way, we have a constant grip on our creation. Hmm. Ours. It's ours. And we'll invite you in when we need you. And Which, I'll keep jumping off the internet and coming back on periodically there we go. here, apparently. <laughs> so by itself, the book of nature is sealed. Because again, as I said, it's God acting outside his promise, outside of Christ. It's the hidden God, as we say. Mm -hmm. It does not show how God is its author and the actor in it, because he's hiding. The other book, God's own book, unseals the book of nature. It discloses the heart of nature and the heart of God as its creator. Even though both books are commentaries on God's word, the book of nature requires God's written word to unlock it and open it up for people to see it as God's creation. However, there is no forgiveness in the book of nature. Nope. And this is key. Right. We have to distinguish these things. I mean, basically, the uh, the book of nature has no promise. Right. But notice, too, then, on this point, I've heard this, I've commented on before, I think I even talked about it in the first book, when I would go to church as a new Christian, and I'd hear the pastor in the sermon say, out there in the real world. Ugh. And the implication, of course, is that what happens in church isn't real, <laughs> or is somehow not sim in simpatico with what's happening out there in the real world. Like These are two different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they, I know that it's a tradition. They don't. They're not. Mean, they don't mean anything malicious by it. However, you've just created an artificial wall between creation and redemption, between sanctification, right. I mean, which takes place in your vocations in the world, and God's sanctifying work of strengthening you in faith and increase of love through the sacraments. I mean, I think you have to be fair and say <clears throat> yes. The forgiveness of sins declared, proclaimed, mm -hmm. you know, delivered in in word and sacrament is not available in in the book of nature yes. or right. yeah in, or in right. the in, in the history of the world right except for the fact that christ has brought it into history and into into the world right. 
right? right? But it, but it's foreign to it by nature. Right. Since, but since the I fall. I get Haman's point because he's just riffing off John 1 that there's nothing that was created that has not been created through the Word of God, who is Jesus. Right. Therefore, right. when you stare at a tree, the Word of God created that tree. <laughs> it's just that simple. And as Luther himself says, in faith, when you have faith in Christ, even the birds singing in the morning speak the resurrection. Isn't that funny with like you have the hills clapping their hands? You're like, wait, yeah, how from the hills clap? Exactly. Their yeah. Hands? <laughs> right. But, but what, how does uh, is it Colossians, right? In him. We have our life and breath and we have live our and being. move and have our being. Yeah. 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 And like, how is that? Wait a minute. So Jesus mm-hmm. is still, not only was he the author, but he's also the preserving word and the ongoing careful yeah. word, right? Yeah. Providing care constantly. Like, do we really believe that? No, we don't. No. It's not, and it's not self evident from nature. No, it's not. From nature, if we go off Romans 1, we end up just worshiping nature. Right. It seems like to be. Reading Habakkuk 1, where he says that the Babylonians worship their strength. I mean, of all the things in nature that I think you could give some worship, is probably the sun, because it. Which, yeah, we. It we just still, keeps going. To this day we worship the sun. It just keeps going. It doesn't we, seem to stop. It keeps providing mm-hmm. sunlight, and it's like, right. oh, well, okay, then we can worship that. The th- right? Those are those are my favorite prophets of doom. Are the ones who are like, you know, in four billion years the sun's going to go supernova and we're all going to die, and you're like, did you intend for me to be scared by that statement? <laughs> like. <laughs> I've been told since I was five years old that in five years the earth is going to melt and or burn up. You got to do better than four million, four billion years from now. Right. I mean, at that point, you might as well worship it because you'll never see whether or not that's actually true or not. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. But it also goes to the point when you read about Egyptians or Sumerians or the people on Easter Island or in India or Australia where they worship the sun because there was some sort of cataclysmic event that caused them to say, you know that stuff that falls out of the sky can kill us, right? <laughs> so maybe we should pay more attention to that and uh, be a little bit more reverent and not so cocky. <laughs> you it doesn't take you long. You can't live life this way, man. Right. But you, it's easy, right? There's a cataclysmic event and everyone tells the story like I was talking about before we hit record on the podcast. And then within three or four generations, the cataclysmic event becomes gods. And we worship the event as right. coming from the gods and so mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, look to the stars, look to the sky, look to the sun, which we worship the sun to this day. It's just, as you noted a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, don't, I gotcha. yeah. we don't pay attention to the fact that we worship the sun, but when you read Genesis 1 and realize that God's ordering of the day is the opposite of how we do it, right. it's like, so, oh. The, hmm. So the point is, I mean, yes, we're dependent upon the sun. I mean, mm-hmm. we would die, right? Yeah. Uh, but then what the scripture does is it, is it gives us to confess that yeah. no, God is the one who mm-hmm. authored the sun. Correct. Right. Yeah. And he, he's also the one that <laughs> causes the sun to continue to shine. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> to burn. To burn right. hot. Yeah. 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 So by itself, then the book of nature is sealed. God hides himself in nature. He doesn't want to be found by us and worshiped by us in that way. Yeah. Don't forget Captain Planet and the, what was the, what, were oh. his te- what was his team he called? Had the Captain? team. Yeah. What was yeah. the team called though? Mm. It was Captain Planet and something. Mm. Don't remember. I just remember Tom Cruise was the voice of Captain Planet originally. Was he? Yeah, he was kind of one of the people who threw money behind the project. The Planeteers. It was Captain Planet and the Planeteers, I think. Very original. So even though both <laughs> books are commentaries on God's word, yeah, one is law and therefore death, and the other one is gospel, therefore life. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you think you're going to find uh, forgiveness, life, and salvation in the book of nature, yep, let me just tell you about the time I was 13 and got lost in the woods. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Not right. fun. So right. Haman says this then. All natural phenomena are dreams, visions, riddles, which have their meaning, their secret sense. The book of nature and the book of history are nothing but ciphers, hidden signs, require, which require the same key that interprets Holy Scripture and is the purpose of its inspiration. Huh. There you meaning, go. Meaning apart from the Holy Spirit, you can't call creation creation or you can't God's understand creation. it yeah that it, it, it doesn't even make sense i mean right. we ask these what do you want to say metaphysical questions right mm-hmm. these big questions yeah. you just say you know high level stuff right like yeah. why do we exist why are we here what's yeah. the purpose of life right 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 but all those questions are just nonsensical which i think douglas adams does a great job of as an atheist right right and just pointing out like the purpose of life oh it's 42 and you're like what it's com- it's an absurd question ultimately um, apart from the revelation of the creator who who right. authors preserves and you know has that ongoing uh, careful mm-hmm. aspect right well think about it this way too 
back to my original point about how the earth is going to end in fire or water every five years. <laughs> because we always have some doomsayer and they always find some young girl to come in and scare us. Yeah. There are stories about the world being, our parts of the world being destroyed right. by fire and water in the but scriptures. But this goes back to my point about hero stories and the knight fighting the dragon, is that these are all a bastardization of the original flood story or mm -hmm. the promise of fire. That, Final judgment, right? Right. That mm -hmm. all this stuff about the climate crises and how we have to save the world, it's a rejection of God and his word. Right, but it's also a co-opting of the of the the revelation of Scripture. Yes, for a different purpose. Yes, right. So they take these, uh, what I would argue are like, um, I mean, almost epigenetic mm -hmm. like stories. Right, they're mm -hmm. they're just like deep seated cultural, like mm -hmm. they 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 preserve they transcend yeah. culture, they transcend mm -hmm. time, stories. Yeah, and then they repurpose them for their own objective. Right. Right. So the story of Jesus coming to judge the the, the earth, right? Yeah. And it's it's like, and then it's used. No, we're actually going to be the ones who judge the earth now, yeah, and or, or we're prematurely bringing judgment upon the earth right. by our actions or something, mm -hmm. you know. It's just and it's just weird bastardization of the story. It mm -hmm. It's it's in a way what we're trying to do is avoid and divert God's judgment without <laughs> actually knowing what we're doing and why we're doing it. We know judgment's coming. For example, if the earth yeah, is yeah. going to end in a ball of fire or melt in the caps and the oceans and blah, blah, blah. But again, we've cut off the person who brought yeah. that in the first place, and uh -huh. therefore we end up worshiping the creation as a death god, a death-dealing right. god. We treat it like a fertility goddess, because that's the way that we, we think about these things. And as a consequence then, how are we going to save the earth? Well, well, in our final judgment, it has a righteous judge. Right making that judgment, not mm -hmm. not just some immaterial, vindictive right. or whatever. But as we know, talked about capricious. with Darwin's origin of species, Darwin actually has a group of people that he thinks deserve to be a part of natural selection and the unseen breeder. Oh, has, the demigods then. Yes. But then uh. he has all those dirty people in London who don't deserve to live. Oh, you mean like what? oligarchy, ruling class, mm -hmm. deep state, you can Eugenics. give whatever name you want. You can you can murder a baby after at twenty eight days in California. The thirteen families. You mm -hmm. pick 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 your poison, but <laughs> right. If, if you, you want. the point of all these examples then is for me anyways, if you reflect on scripture and then you turn a critical eye towards California passing a law that says a mother can, you know, abort a non viable fetus twenty eight days after it's out of the, the womb, which you're a murderer. Stop trying to put, play word games. You're just you like want to murder fetus your baby that's been delivered is exactly yeah a birth medically... person delivers a fetus that is un, non viable. What you're saying is that this person doesn't want this baby, so they're going to kill it. Just say it. But as my kids, my kids recognize this immediately. Didn't we start off with heartbeat laws, and now we're at 28 days outside the womb? So how long will it be till we start killing the mentally handicapped, the elderly, and anybody who doesn't fit within our definition of what is viable? Well, all you need is a food shortage. Then you have exactly. then you have cause. Exactly. It's like, well, we can't mm -hmm. sustain everybody. You know, it's so a crisis. So we'll read the Bible, to your point, and we'll say, well, I just don't believe that God would kill all those Israelites in the desert like that. And then we'll turn and look at a place like California or Iceland, by the way, where there's less than 1% handicapped population because they test for it mm -hmm. in, in the utero. Womb, in utero. Yeah. And then they're like, hey, you know, you're going to have a kid who's mentally handicapped who has Downs. We can help you with that. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, exactly. But when you're playing God, who cares? If There's no maybes. There's just my word versus your word, and I'm an expert. So let's see. And what's crazy about this is, I mean, this script has been written. I've referred to it again. I think it's like yeah. 99. Isn't that when Gattaca came out? Yes. Ethan Hawke and Jude Law, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just like, we wrote this script. They wrote yep. the script. We watched right. the movie, and, and it was well, a negative. It's all time. Yeah. It was presented as a negative, right? right. Then. Or Children of Men was another one. And you're yeah. just like... But now, mm. Mm? yeah. then it was, but now it's not. Now it's a positive. It's weird. It is. Times, the times they are a change. Well, and I've wondered about that, if, if there's a way of, um, you know, with this, all this conversation about misinformation, disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, I don't, I don't know that they actually care whether something that they want to do is presented in a negative or a positive, as long as mm -hmm. people are, what do you want to say, acclimated to the idea of it. Right. It's priming, right? We call it priming. Right, but you could be primed 
mm-hmm. for the thing, but yeah. but by way of the negative. Yeah, absolutely. And you're still like, oh, well, now we can consider pedophilia because we've been hearing about it for decades. Correct. All right, or years, mm-hmm. <laughs> as yeah. the case may be, or since mm-hmm. Pizza Gate or whatever. Yeah. Right. You're like, well, no, it's a lot older than that. But now, because it's part of common conversation, and mm-hmm. we even like aren't ashamed to say the word out loud. Do you remember? In the ni- in the early '90s, when we were both in college, this is when I was when I first remember hearing this is that I was told, and I can't remember the conversation. It was in a classroom setting, but that back in the '20s and '30s, the sex scandals in Hollywood, for example, and mm-hmm, yeah. or back in the 1800s when you would marry your 13 year old cousin or something, and the 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 reason was well, times were different back then, and people were different, and you know, kids were more mature back then, hmm. and it was just explained away like that. Like, no, it's not, it, it's not pedophilia. It's just the times were different and people were different. And you're like, oh, okay. But because you're young and, and you don't understand what just said and you don't understand the ramifications because you're, you're young and experienced. But now as a parent and, and as a person who's matured and seasoned, I think back and then go, oh, you were priming me to accept pedophilia mm-hmm. as being, because then you can just dig that argument up in the future and say, well, times are different now. Kids are more mature now. We heard this during the lockdowns the past year. Kids are, they're, they're, they're malleable. Kids are, they can adapt quickly. Resilient. They're resilient. That's the word. Thank you. Yeah, kids mm-hmm. are resilient. Really? Because um, I got the statistics for the mental health issues that kids are suffering from now. And the learning curve has plummeted for a lot of kids. Like They're not learning like they used to. They're not engaging oh. like they used to. Jared has a good point there. That's true. I forgot that was in there. With the Harkonnens, right? They're yeah. the ones that are the pedos, yeah. Yeah, the Harkonnens mm-hmm. and Dune are in the book. Pedophiles, yeah. But it's left out in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, good for them for leaving it out. <laughs> well, and the, and but Paul makes this point, right? Mm-hmm. He says these things must not be named among you. Uh-huh. They're anathema, right? And it's not just. I mean, I've I've often just taken that as like, well, um, you know, we don't have people practicing this in our congregation. I think that's the. I think that's the the clear meaning of the text, mm-hmm. right? But it's also like we just don't talk about it. Not publicly. We should, we're not going to talk about this. I mean, it, yeah. and uh, and that then that corresponds to the whole thing. Like, I didn't know what adultery was until I until I had the law, and now I now mm-hmm. I, you know I commit adultery all the time in my heart. Right? right. It was like you know this is the whole argument against like right. explicit sexual education. It's like right. I wish personally my seventh grade teacher had not described all of those things for me. Correct. I didn't need to know them. Mm-hmm. I was going to be exposed to them, and I think right. the thought is like, if we expose them and we tell them, and like, no, <laughs> actually, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it wasn't helpful, right, mm-hmm. in that regard, because I was ignorant, and and right. you know, ignorance is bliss in that regard, right? Mm-hmm. It's better. It's like I don't right. need to know about how how, what, how the pagans behave. <laughs> well, there's a time and a season for everything, and we are so disdainful of the past. And, and so active in rewriting history and, and memory holding things that we don't like or we don't agree with, that we don't take seriously. There's a reason that you weren't allowed to read the Song of Songs until you were 30. There's the example, yeah. You know, or that these rites of passage that you went through as a boy or a girl, these are, we don't have those in our culture. So you get the information without the rite of passage. Well, now, and, especially with the smartphone in the pocket and... You know, right, and so what happens, no it goes, it goes yeah. back to the Socratic method of, I'm going to act like a midwife and bring the truth out of you because it's in you already, versus, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm naive to this. This happened to my children last week, so it's fresh in my mind because another older child who had just recently gone through their sex education unit, um, who doesn't obviously understand what he's talking about, was saying things to my 10-year-old, and uh, I had a conversation with his father. Yeah, you have to. And I explained to him what's going to happen if this if this continues, and um, and the father is someone he's a friend he's someone I respect and so I understood that I'd be heard and I was very clearly. I'm like this cannot happen again and it will not, um, or there will be consequences. And the father said he doesn't know what he's saying. I'm like I understand that, but that's not acceptable. You need to educate him then. Right. Well, and what's behind that? It's not just mm-hmm. ideas, but it's actually that the words matter. Correct. Because well, the words also, the words... as I explained though, I'm like, my son is 10 and my son doesn't understand what your son is saying. And so then he asks his older sister, my, my daughter is 15, right. what does that mean? That's and what then, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah it, it, it leads to investigation. The words right. lead to investigation. Right. 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 I mean, and this is, the scripture does this too, right. in, a, in a positive sense. Well, I think right. too, as a parent, you, you, I'm sure are with me on this. I want my children to enjoy being children. 
until they're not children. Right. And the world demands that my children not be children. Right. You have to be like a little adult. It's like, no, no. I talk to my children the way that I talk to adults. I expect my children to be thoughtful, to ask questions, to be critical thinkers. Right. But I have to teach them how to do that. But it's like and grown also, adults just who are I acting. talk to them a certain way doesn't mean I expect them to behave like an adult. There's a difference. Right. Right, that's true. That's true too. I was thinking like of, you know, grown adults who mm -hmm. disdain, the you know, the domain of marriage, mm -hmm. right? And but act as if everything within marriage that belongs within marriage is theirs to have outside yes, of it. Yes, right. Yep. Right, and it's like no, you're actually being, you know, not only just immoral, but I mean, you're acting like a child. Yes. Like oh, I can be, I can play dad today. I can mm -hmm. play mom or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're play yeah. acting in yeah. a way. I got married in third grade. Happened outside the high school gym. During recess, I got married. Got the little. Remember, you could go in for a quarter or whatever it was. You could, you know, go to the machine and then. But you see, I would the, rather that, right? Yeah. Like get married and then figure thing, find out yeah. things. Right. Like, oh, this is what belongs in marriage. Yeah. yeah. But what we were doing, we were just play acting. We saw adults do this, and so then we did it. And mm -hmm. you know, somebody was chosen to be the priest. They performed the marriage. You know, they made up a little book. Right, out but of paper today you're going to be like, and, well, well, my uncle, you know, he lives with mm -hmm. his girlfriend. Right. So how are you going to play act that? Right, you can. Well, you can, but I wouldn't suggest it. Right, but that's what you're telling the kids is that this is, you're playing house. Because that used to be a term. We're playing house. Oh, yeah, that's true. I always mock the, the older couples in my congregation that would um, act act as if they were married but didn't, mm -hmm. but refused to marry. They mm -hmm. would even live in the same home. and be like, this is, not only is it immoral, but it's mm -hmm. like, you have grandchildren. You have yeah. children. Just get married and stop paying taxes. It's okay. We understand why you're doing it. Oh, no, well, the, yeah, that's the thing. It's always, well, we're going to lose our Social Security. Mm -hmm. Well, pff, so what? You right. don't deserve, you don't, it's not yours. If yeah. you, you're just lying, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're mm -hmm. lying to everybody. Yeah. And, you're, an make, and you're making, and you're making a mockery of marriage. Yeah, it's so. a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I get it. Yeah. Cut it out, man. So the same spirit that created the natural world and inspired the Bible and seals the book of nature for the human observer. In his book, The Bible, God does not present himself as its omniscient author, who is remote from the plot of the story and uninvolved in its implementation. Also, we should note, for those of you who are keyed in, um, you can hear the rumblings of the postmodern narrative yeah. literary criticism in this too. And the, uh, what began with the Enlightenment, right? Yes. So yeah. even though I agree with Haman, or at least Kleine's take on Haman here, I also hear the warning signs in the back, or the warning bells in the background of, this leads to postmodernity, so be careful. Well, Which and is, I think that, yeah. and that, and again, that's why we're reading this Haman character because the way that uh, today the people reading it today are taking him as yeah. they're taking him as a warning against postmodernism, mm -hmm. and that, and that maybe he seems to perceive that coming. I, sure, I don't know. I don't know if that's true here with his meditations or not. But anyway, nonetheless, I just want to add that as an aside. Mm -hmm. Language games, right? Language games. He is the central character in his book, the main actor and speaker in his book, even though he is not presented as such, but only as one of many actors. This is how Haman invites us to envisage the involvement of the triune God in that story. Quote, consider how God the Father has humbled himself by not only forming a lump of earth, but also giving it a soul with his breath. Consider how God the Son has humbled himself. He became a man became the least of all people and took on the form of a servant. He became the most hapless of them. He was made sin for us. In God's eyes, he was the sinner of the whole people. Consider how low God the Holy Spirit has condescended by becoming a historian hmm, of the smallest, most contemptible, most insignificant incidents on earth. Why? So as to reveal the mysteries and ways of God to mankind in its own speech, its own history, in its own ways. That's actually that's a really good statement. It really is. It's profound. Isn't that? But that you you uh, stuttered a little bit on that statement about the Holy Spirit being a historian, becoming a historian. I did because I was trying not to sneeze. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know if you, if you were <laughs> yeah. remarking to it. But but the idea, yeah, I mean, this is what it means that the Scripture is inspired, breathed yeah. into. The Spirit mm -hmm. um, compels these these men to write. Right. Write down uh, how does how does uh, Luke say it? You know, O Theophilus. You know, I, I endeavored to give you a faithful account. Yeah, right. But also like, the beginning, the the Spirit of God was hovering, was brooding over the abyss. Yeah, that He's always there. He's in well, the and creation then, and yeah. over the creation and under the create. It's He's everywhere. 
testifying to mm-hmm. what ha- what what right. happened, what is happening, what will happen. Well, and this is an interesting thought then that we be- I th- you and I both believe this, but we just don't comment it very often, which is the Holy Spirit isn't reserved to just sanctifying Christians. <laughs> oh, but yeah. We often yeah. just treat the Holy Spirit as like, what's the Holy Spirit do? Hey, he brings the gospel and he delivers his gifts and that's Well, it. that's the third article of the Creed. <clears throat> right. But he's in the first article too. Mm-hmm. In the fact that, yeah, he is actually over the creation and involved in the creation of the creation and then preserves and protects the creation. Well, I mean, if you're going to take at least the end of John seriously, Jesus has been breathing on these disciples for three years, the Spirit. Yeah, right, right. In their catechesis, right? Right. I mean, because the Spirit descends on Jesus at his baptism. (laughs) So you would say Jesus is a close talker? I know. I always, (laughs) always do that with the kids. I'm like... He's speaking to them. His breath is coming out. It's a close talker. Like, hopefully, they didn't have garlic uh, with their fish that morning. You need a uh, some of that. I got a, I got a whole box of mints in my pocket. Take one. I mean, some of that. I'm, I had a Jewish employer I've mentioned before, mm-hmm. and he would uh, he would make what they call that fish gefilte fish. It's oh, this, yeah? like fermented and boiled mm-hmm. fish. It's the most. He would bring it to work. Mm-hmm. And nice. I, he had me yeah. taste it one time, and then yeah. bought, then and then I said, "Oh, this is kind of good." And then I he'd keep bringing yeah. it. My track coach in high school had uh, halitosis, and I don't know. You, oh, is that chronic halitosis? Breath? Yeah, yeah, basically mouth rot. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> if bacterial? he grabbed you around the shoulder and pulled you in because he wanted to teach you like something, that's how he he would do it. And it was just like you held your breath and just hoped it was a short lesson, because if you had to inhale, it was just so gnarly. Okay, so it's a Passover thing. It's poached carp, whitefish, or pike. Mm. So it's Ashkenazi. And, uh, okay, Sadness so this is what it is. All right, so how do you make it here? It's traditionally cooked inside the intact skin of the fish, mm-hmm. forming a loaf, and then sliced into portions. Okay, uh, what? Where, where's the where's the recipe? Oh, there's sweet versus savory. Give me a mm-hmm. recipe. Mm-hmm. What's the stuff that's in it? I don't know. I All right. Well, out. you're on that rabbit trail. I will continue reading. You no, it, back it, my point is, is it smells nasty. Yes. Okay. That's, Moving yeah. along. And to the old Adam, when Jesus comes, leans in close, starts talking. Guess what? Stinketh. He stinketh. <laughs> the old Adam, but the the Holy Spirit is a sweet, sweet. That's what I'm smell. saying, though. To the old Adam, it's well, it's a revelation that when I ate it, it was sweet on my tongue like honey. But when it hit my stomach, oof, it was like Chipotle at two in the morning. Yeah, I was I was always struck by that. With um, who is it that has to eat, uh, has to speak the words of woe and judgment, and but mm-hmm. then when he's given to eat it, it's it's mm-hmm. is that Ezekiel? No, it's not Ezekiel. Isaiah. Is it Isaiah that I it's given it. to speak in the words of woe and judgment? I think that's Jeremiah. Yeah, let's go. And he said, and, and he says it's sweet. Yeah. And I'm like, no, it's <laughs> maybe it's just if you're if you're, if you're a preacher of woe and judgment. Yeah. You like to do it. You like to say it. Saying. I guess I don't know. Or maybe it's just that it's God's word. I like I like the stinky cheese. Yeah. <laughs> so in the Bible, then God reveals the highest mysteries in the most lowly, least divine, and most human terms. For the main character in it is Jesus, God's incarnate Son, the perfect man who is God's image and likeness, and also the worst of all sinners because he bears the sins of the world. Jesus translates what God has to say into ordinary human speech using language that he himself has borrowed from us. This means that even though the Bible is God's book, it is open to human criticism for its supposed omissions and apparent imperfections. Ooh. Nice. Somebody's going to get upset about that. Right? How dare you? That's what we were talking about before we um, started recording the audio version, right? On Mm -hmm. the the live stream. That, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to just... to. I, maybe maybe do people hear the way that we read the Bible, that historic grammatical method, mm-hmm. as that critical method? I mean, it is critical. Yeah. Yeah. That we're reading it critically as if we don't believe it. No, we're reading it for detail, right. for for nuance. We're reading it for, uh, right. especially when we're reading in translation, right, as we talked right. about. We're looking for um, where, like that, that word, exousia, that's authority. Yeah. It's yeah. often translated as power, which is mm-hmm. not really its meaning. But, right. And, so then that's one of the things I'm like keyed in on, right? I'm looking yeah. for that yeah. to see, mm, is this one of those places where, or uh, blessed are those who uh, hear the word yeah. of God and uh, obey it, right? right. It's like, no, <laughs> that's in not fact, what you and I means. believe the Bible so much that we believe the things in the Bible that we're told are fairy tales and myths. Yeah. Well, then we well, that... believe they were real. Right. Or are but, real. But it, but it's open to criticism. And I want to mm-hmm. go back to that book of uh, nature. Mm-hmm. It's like, 
uh, and then the way that Haman brings the book of history into the mm -hmm. book of nature, right? It's like, no, Jesus was born in a real place, real time, and mm -hmm. it was subject to investigation, right? Yeah. Not only in his lifetime, but especially in his suffering and death, yeah. Right, and then you have the eyewitness testimony, and um, I think this is probably essential for us as uh, as Christians yeah. to re recognize that the canon of the New Testament, maybe with the exception of, of Revelation, mm -hmm. uh, is written within. Um, you know, within a generation of the events, right, right. And it's written, it, and it's written within um, the timeline of the eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That they, that they, this is their eyewitness testimony, right. and it's faithful and true, right. Um, but you know, uh, you, both of us went to <clears throat> seminary at a time when probably the pro, the predominant theories were, you know, at at best before the destruction of Jerusalem, that's yeah. eighty seventy, mm -hmm. and and in some cases after, yeah, like fifty years after Jesus right. rises from the dead. Yeah. Um, now that, I mean, but even that is probably not as hostile as some people take mm -hmm. the scriptures in the right. New Testament as far as its historicity. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. 50 years ago, what happened 50 years ago? What are we in? So 30, 1970, right? Cuban Missile Vietnam. Crisis or something. Vietnam, right? Yeah. You can still interview eyewitnesses. Yes. And get an accurate testimony 100%. of it even 50 years Absolutely. later. Absolutely. Sure. How do you think we know about Cain and Abel and Seth? Because there was, the generations... There was no one sitting there with a stylus and a clay tablet, like, okay, go ahead, Seth, say what you got. No. Yeah, that's because, also eyewitness. That's true. Yes. No. There's always a preacher. There's always a preacher. Right, but that I, idea of eyewitness being... Yeah. And I like, the, I like the eyewitness not relegated to the New Testament alone, mm -hmm. because you know they, they're all endeavoring to give you a historic account. Right. Yes. I mean, even, even creation, which is a little bit harder, right? We've yeah. talked about that with 24-hour days. Mm-hmm. But it's still history. Yeah. <laughs> you know, God knit together mm -hmm. the whole world as right. he knits us together in our womb, right. in mother's womb, right? He gave us the two lights to provide light for the day and light for the night. Well, to give him light so he could work, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a, I've never thought of that. That's kind of a funny idea. Yeah. It's like, you need, you need work lights. Come on. Right. Well, you know. <laughs> it's just interesting. We read it, it and we just pass over it. And then we, well, and here's the key then, right? Before we move on. We then apply our understanding of natural history and our understanding of the world to God's word and go, well, I know it says two lights, but what we really mean is one light and then another planetary sphere that reflects the light of the first light. So what? And the okay. reason we say that is because, well, they were so ignorant, they didn't understand the way that the universe works and we've got total... The sun rises, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, sun rises, that kind of stuff. And it's like, mm, really? <laughs> we're going to go with that? That's And it, it's fine. If you're of the world, you want to explain it away that way, that's great. But as Christians... You just blindly well, my, accept that. My point is, it's like it's actually essential that we believe, mm -hmm. in whatever sense you want to say this, that right. the sun rises and it sets. Why, right? Mm -hmm. God gives us the night and the day, right? He orders mm -hmm. our days, and and that's right. how we understand that, right? And then mm -hmm. and then it's used um, analogically, right? Yeah. This is Jesus will come to us as the sun rises mm -hmm. from the east, right? Right. You know, and it, so it ends up having that theological import. Now, right. I know it's just the earth spinning and we're going around the sun and all this kind no, of stuff. No, it's not. Right? But anyways, continuing. <laughs> <laughs> Are you back to the ter terrestrial dome or whatever? Never left it. <sighs> okay, well. Never left it. No, actually, I'm, heli I'm, I'm not heliocentric. I'm, earth and, you know, I don't, I, that's just, I know mathematically it works better to have a, the, the sun at the center of the universe. But... Inverse square law, baby. Thank you, Paul. And as Jared notes here too, Jared Fuller on the live stream, um, if the Bible is written solely as fiction or a little M mythology, it would have way more crazier events in it, you know, like at least more than one talking donkey. You know, you're 100% right. Absolutely. Or or like mystery writings on the walls or, yeah. Yeah. or gi giant giant people or, yeah. or angels. Actually, I can tell you actually, I could make an argument that I could tell you exactly what the Bible would be read, would be written like if it were a work of fiction. Because I am extremely familiar with Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was just reading about the Norse creation myth yesterday. And it sounds exactly like Genesis 1. Almost to a T. As except? if it, like, except there's a couple of wrinkles in there where you're like, oh, right. Right. No. Well, as we said, uh, said a little while ago, it's like the book of nature has no promise in it. Yes. You, re you, read, you read through the revelation of history mm -hmm. as it's told by the scriptures. Right. Right, uh, and you see that through, mm -hmm. woven through the whole thing is the promise of grace, mercy, and but peace. But here's the thing: here's the one thing that I'll, I'll leave the listeners to think of. Every creation myth, except for Genesis, 
involves the death of a god and their blood being used to make either us, the oceans, or the universe. Hmm. Every one, every one that I've ever read, whether it be Tiamat or Odin fighting the old so gods, or, it's always yeah. a god being killed in order hmm. to make the new universe. Hmm. Notice that. Hmm. It's like it's like when you when you watch a, a person's movies I and in every movie, die. let's just say, you know George Lucas, and how in all of his movies we have we have uh, children growing up without their parents. Well, guess what happened in George's life? He grew up without one of his parents. What are you saying? You write what you know. Exactly. Hmm. <laughs> it's like if you had a violent divorce and all of your movies involve <clears throat> the woman in the movie being horribly like killed or disfigured or something. It's like, I think you're projecting. <laughs> in every creation myth, a god is chopped up and killed. In Egyptian myth, the god is chopped up and killed and forms the universe. It's almost as if we got a problem with God. This is why I can't watch Scandinavian movies. <laughs> oh, The Northman. It's so good. Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. Right. That's the new one, right? Right. No, I, but uh, I'm trying to think of some of these because they're just, they're just so dark and depressing. I'm like, I would never mm -hmm. want to be a Scandinavian. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's but, obviously... Oh, their, their detective shows are the best. I love uh -huh. them. Yeah. Yeah. I like the Welsh was, ones Oh, The too, Trip. But... I just watched The Trip. I don't know it's, that one. Oh, it's so good. It's, it's very dark humor, but it's so good. If you like dark humor, The Trip, it's uh, Naomi Rapace is in it. Mm -hmm. And another guy who's been in a lot of movies that I really like a lot. Um, but yeah, basically it's, it's a couple who go to the cabin for the weekend and they both independent of the other person have plotted the other person's murder. <laughs> oh no. And then it, and then all of a sudden there's, there's escaped convicts that get involved and accomplices and his dad. And it's really funny, but super dark. It's very Scandinavian. Um, it's one of those movies where you either laugh out loud or you're like, mm, I don't see the humor in this. But anyways, that's us in a nutshell when it comes to God. We're just like, I don't, I don't think we need a God, as the New York Times editorial said uh, on Easter weekend. You know, every year. <laughs> every year. We got to get rid of God. It just interferes with, you know, dealing with real life. It, good luck getting rid, rid of God. You're just going to put a different God in its place. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So Jesus translates what God has to say into ordinary human speech, and there it is. That all of these creation myths, they all are missing the one thing. The that translator? The translator, exactly. And so mm -hmm. it's left up to us to translate. And guess what? We always come out the other side of, well, some gods fought with some other gods or some titans fought with the gods and then they killed them and that's how we all came to be. And now things are the way they are and the gods are arbitrary and capricious and we just got to do our best and hope that in our obedience Ends up to just them... just being a reflection of natural life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just yep. with higher metaphorical, right, exactly. metaphysical stuff. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the setting of the action is on two stages. On the one hand, the general action of the story is set on the world as its stage with Jesus as the main character and all the angels and all the people as spectators and actors and script writers. On the other hand, that general action is matched by what happens personally in the soul of the believer. Quote, I am convinced that every soul is a stage for the great wonders that are contained in the history of creation in the entire Holy Scripture. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. We have to think about that one for a couple of days or weeks. The course of the life of every Christian is included in the daily work of God, in his covenants with people, in transgressions, warnings, revelations, miraculous preservations, and so on. For a Christian who has passed from the death of sin into a new life, can the preservation of Jonah, the raising of Lazarus, the healing of the cripple, and so on be conceived as greater miracles. Does not the Savior himself say, which is easier, to forgive sins or to say, take up your bed and walk? Huh. Right. So, so his point is, is that the stories yeah. of the Scripture are being worked out by God the Holy Spirit in your life daily. Yeah. Every day. Right. And the, this, you know, obviously the, the big overarching one is, mm -hmm. you know, whoever desires to follow after me must take up his cross and follow yeah. me. Right. That's Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he, he is, Jesus is working. <laughs> he's working out in your life, your own crucifixion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is, That's you know, a really I mean, great way of putting it though. I like yeah. that. Because it's a question that comes up for me a lot when I talk about, it's not you who suffers, but Christ in you who suffers. And therefore Christ's death on the cross is your death. And people yeah. go, what do you mean by that? Because yeah. I quote Colossians and, and Galatians when, he, when Paul uses that really 
kind of sci-fi fantastic language to describe like it's no longer you who live but Christ who lives in you. And it's like yeah, what but it's almost too abstract, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I like how he explains it here. Very simply like, hey, the reason that your pastor uses these biblical examples of Lazarus or Jonah or whoever it might be is because that's you. That's that's what God is doing every day in your life. It's almost it's almost young yen, right? Yeah. Like yeah, like yeah. those are the like those are these uh, archetypes. Yeah. That that are common to all experience of yeah. you know of of Christians throughout time. You know, maybe not back to your point about you know for lack of a better term at this point epigenetic memory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is the fact again, like we've been talking about, these stories are not only real historical events, but then they're translated into mythic tales. I think one to cushion the blow and obviously deny God, mm-hmm. but but to cushion the blow to us so that when they do happen, we can say, well, these are tropes in, you know, in, in, in oh, yeah, movie there you go. terms, yeah. it's a trope. Right, and that's right. why when you're watching a movie and you recognize that there's the protagonist, the antagonist, oh, here's the second act starting because there's a problem and it looks like they've lost and now we're, you know, we're building up anticipation for the, the conclusion and the resolution of the things. These are all tropes. But... What he's saying is, yeah, all of these things that we call tropes or we call archetypes in Jungian terms, it's just us running with God's word and actual historical events and saying, well, not that way, but this way. Right. And it's, this is not exactly the same as the, what do they call it? Um, the, you know, the fourfold interpretation, tropological sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not quite the same because that was like had to do with morality. You're right. Tropological, that, that sense was like, what's the moral lesson? Like an Aesop fable, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, what's kind of the point? That's not Which what he's saying reduces, here. reduces, well, that's Jefferson, like we refer to mm-hmm. either. That's kind of what Jefferson does, is he reduces the Bible to just another piece of wisdom literature. Oh, that's the subheading, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the life and moral lessons of Jesus. Exactly. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Right. So Jesus becomes this example of like how to right. live a good life. And we can mock that, but how many people, Christians, read the Beatitudes as. Again, asking the question, how do I apply these in my life? When you hear those, I mean, I hear them by way of law, mm-hmm. right? Th- these are an accusatory word, mm-hmm. right? Because I, mm-hmm. I don't live up to, to what it, the blessings that it supposedly is. But of course, that's, <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. that's to do violence to the word blessed, right? Right, like exactly. Well, and also not to recognize that Jesus is speaking reflexively there. Right, applying exactly. those terms to himself. Yes. And the only reason I can make that argument is because I've read the prophets who say the same thing. Yeah. That the, that the father um, rev- blesses his son yeah. you know, to be these things for us. Right. Hmm. Someone said to my wife uh, a couple days ago that she's not a good Christian. What does that and, even uh, mean? Yeah. Well, again, uh, luckily I wasn't there. But um, <laughs> hey, 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 Steel Maze Nation, shout out to my brother from the East Coast. Good to see you. Um, that I'm like, well, there's only one who's good. So of course I'm not a good Christian. And the fact that you put the word good on the word Christian shows to me that you just are trying to manipulate my wife because she said or did something that you don't agree with. And that's how you're going to attempt to get power back. <laughs> it reminds like, me of like, of the, the church politic conversations where mm-hmm. we, we create these categories of, you know, there's the, there's the heterodox and the mm-hmm. orthodox and right. the her- heretical. Yeah. Well, the heretical aren't Christian, but the heterodox are still Christian and the in, orthodox. They're Christian light. <laughs> right? And then you, then you read the early ecumenical councils and you're like, these guys had really, I think I texted you this, they yes. had really radically different ideas about yes. like say scripture mm-hmm. or even how they would confess Christ. Right. Right. And and yet they still considered each other Christians, and they didn't have mm-hmm. the the categorical distinctions. Right, it was like they all get f- met to council. Yeah, you know. My favorite too, though, is that they would start the council before other people got there. Well, so yeah. I mean, they, they're still <laughs> they're still playing parties and teams and whatever. It's, it's yeah. my favorite thing that they're like, "Oh, you didn't get the letter on time." I don't know what happened. I mean, it's probably because you live oh, you in mean we, Africa. And we and called the council to talk about you anyway. <laughs> you're right, exactly. It's like, but now that you're here, we can continue. I mean, we voted on all the good stuff, but we, you know, we got to figure are, out who's going to be. We already the condemned your teaching, but <laughs> exactly, yeah. But if you have anything to say, welcome. yeah, welcome. <laughs> yeah, you know, a good Christian assembly. I mean, just faithful, charitable people. Uh, church councils, the original passive aggressive church policy. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That's. I mean, if it wasn't for those kinds of meetings, we wouldn't have any uh, council elders or trustees or any officers. <laughs> the meeting before the meeting, yeah. Uh, we had a kangaroo court meeting in December where I texted the council and said, I'm nominating so-and-so as a trustee. And all the council went, so uh, uh, I'll second that, and so be it. 
And then I showed up on church the next Sunday. I said, hey, we had a kangaroo court last week, and we elected uh, this guy right here to be our trustee. You cool with that? Good. Anybody got a problem with that? Okay, we're good. <laughs> we did that, too. We came to kind of say, we'd like you to be on the, on the, on the church council. Yeah. Our, we're calling him board of directors, but whatever. We'd yeah. like you to be on the on the board of directors, uh, but we had already discussed and already agreed we'd already that he's decided on the board for of you that you're going to be on the board. <laughs> and we already talked to your wife too, and she yeah, agreed. So <laughs> exactly, oh, it's the best. There's free your free will. Christ. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, so carrying on, these two plots then come together in Jesus and His redemption. For quote, all history, all miracles, all the commandments and works of God converge at its at this point in order to lead the human soul out of the slavery, the bondage, the blindness, the folly, and the death of sin to the greatest happiness, the highest blessedness, and a reception of such good gifts that their greatness, when they are revealed to us, must shock us more than our own unworthiness or the possibility of making ourselves worthy of them. Oh, that's that's about as Lutheran as it gets, isn't it? Right, isn't it? Oh, hey, there we go. As Lutheran as it gets. Um, throwback, yeah. Throwback. But... It, it's such a great point that if you don't preach the law lawfully, then the gospel isn't sweet. Yeah. And the yeah. and it, again, it, it, if you can't preach the death of the sinner and the death of this old world and the ongoing acts of God to cook and roast you in order to translate you into the kingdom, what good is absolution? If there's no real death, why do you even need a real absolution? It simply exists, exists in the abstract, like we've been talking about. It exists in the realm of myth. Yeah. Yeah. It's not my practice uh, preaching. Um, maybe I do it unintentionally sometimes, but I don't do it intentionally. But it seems like you, you, you have to drag people out to the point where, where they mm -hmm. actually believe that there's not going to be any gospel for them. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And then you preach the gospel to them. Exactly. You know? 100%. And we, it, it's like, what are you doing? You're dragging them into the grave, I suppose, in a way mm -hmm. through the law by the preaching of the law. Right. And then, but that's his point, right? He said, "I just that's a great expression. Must shock us more than our own unworthiness. Yeah, 100%. Like if the gospel comes as a shock, right? Like it wakes you up, like whoa, you know." Well, Paul brings this up on the dead. live stream. He uses the term therapeutics, or what he means by therapeutic preaching, meaning you know, kind of do assuage your tender conscience, <laughs> make you feel good, pacify you. But it's a great point that I've I haven't really riffed off of in my own thoughts until he, Paul brings it up here. So thank you, Paul, which is this. Even though we make up less than 5% of the world's population in the United States, <laughs> we, cons we consume more than 45% of the world's pharmaceutical drugs. And investments you mean are the ma those magic are. potion, magic potions. Yeah, magic potions. Okay. But a majority of that are SSRIs. They're mood enhancers, mood stabilizers. That's why we closed all the institutional hospitals. Right. Yeah. But I, again, reflecting on the book of nature, reflecting on therapeutics, of course then, when you come into the church, your pastor is um, uh, anesthetized, and you're anesthetized, and so of course the message that you want to hear is more therapeutics, because your entire life is governed by therapeutics. Put me back to sleep. Yeah, yeah put me back to keep me. It's Soma. It's from Brave New World. It's Soma. So mm -hmm. what you want in life is Soma. You want the pills. And then when you come to church on Sunday, the last thing that you want is for the pastor to come in with a marching band to wake you all up, to declare to you that it's all an illusion, it's all a fiction. Or the paddles. You're... What are those paddles called? Oh, yeah, you know? the defibrillators? Yeah, to have, right. defibrillate you <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> from, just, the, from or death. Or just take the law and gospel as adrenaline shots oh, like yeah. in Pulp Fiction and just jam it in your heart and hit it. Like the yeah. last thing that you want when you come to church on Sunday is that. Don't hit me with the paddles. That's, that's a good analogy, right? Yeah, because it's it's uh, or or it's like the nar narcon, right? Because you're yeah. you've overdosed on therapeutics. Yes, hundred yes, percent. And that's really then what what long gospel becomes. It becomes this narcan mm -hmm. that just shocks you awake immediately, and you look around and you're like, "What the hell's going on?" It's like right. you've been asleep this whole time, mm -hmm. and you didn't even know it because you're surrounded by sleepwalkers. And so, yes, of course, the expectation when you come to church on Sunday is going to be. Continue to therapize me, continue to administer the therapeutics to me, just keep me anesthetized, and just tell me it's all, gonna, again, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Yeah, and I think this is why, uh, you know, we haven't talked about it in a while, Inception. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was, uh, I was thinking about a movie that I really enjoyed, and then I didn't know that it was directed by Christopher Nolan. Hmm. And, it, and it came up, and I'm like, oh, that was directed by Christopher Nolan, but I can't remember what it was now. Um, it was pretty early, right, Momento? in his career. But he didn't, no, but he didn't write it. Mm, it's okay. one that he didnn't write, but that he directed. He directed? Mm-hmm. No. Is it the yep. following? 
No, it's after that. Hmm. Uh, I but it's know. yeah. So you find find one that he directed that he didn't write. Um, but uh, talking about Inception, right? Why is that so profound? Because mm-hmm. you know th- that does seem to be you know as an analogy f- uh, for preaching. It's like you, you're drawn out of one dream and you find out you're still in another dream. Insomnia. Oh yeah, it was Insomnia. Yeah, mm. I, I, it, great it, movie. I know it was really remarkable. Well, because he just speaking of uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, undermining people's expectations. It's like you can't put Robin Williams as the villain right? and put Pacino as the as the hero. <laughs> and yet, when you see Robin Williams in that movie, you're like, oh yeah. Okay. Well, that was when I realized that he really isn't well. Yes, personally, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. That and one hour photo, but yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's that too. Well, yeah. And Paul asks, have you either of us heard of the game We Happy Few? Yeah, it's in my queue on Xbox Live. I haven't uh, downloaded it yet, but yeah, no, I'm, a, I'm aware of the game. Okay, I'm not. It's compelling. The description of it's compelling, and it pertains to I'm not to getting this. into gaming. I don't need another hobby. There we go. So, it's fantastic. So, the second metaphor now. That was the first one. Uh, I think we're going to have to come back uh, for the next two. But I think we are. The second metaphor it here. is the picture of divine condescension. The German term for this is Herablasung. That's better. It de- bless you too. <laughs> it describes an act by which a person in a high position with superior knowledge and power leaves that place to sit down on the ground with lowly people to interact with them in their own terms, like a mother with her baby. Or the pastor with the children. Yeah. That's the story of the Buddha. Oh, it is. Riding yeah. this carriage, seeing the poor. Then abandoning it all to go sit under a Bodhi tree and receive enlightenment from a serpent Hmm. under a tree. Hmm. The serpent surrounded by a nimbus of light. Hmm. Are you saying that Buddhism is demonic? No, I'm just pointing out that the story itself includes these details that, again, seem to echo Genesis chapter (laughs) 3. And this serpent, by the way, is always depicted as an enormous serpent. Enormous. Yeah, like uh, like uh, uh, on it in uh, in uh, Moon Knight, but you haven't seen that, so no, I refuse. Sorry, it's, he's one of my favorite characters from back when I was a kid reading comics. Uh, Oscar Isaac does a pretty good job, I think. I've heard that even from people that were critical of the script writing and, and so forth. They said that he's a phenomenal yeah. actor. Which no, I mean yeah. he carries the he carries it. Yeah. Ethan Hawke is not that great, and no, no. But Oscar Isaac is really he's a compelling guy. What was the mm-hmm. what was the one sci fi one that he was in? I enjoyed quite a bit. What Ex Machina. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Just that he can bring that kind of profundity, not necessarily to the script, just to his like delivery. Yeah, just how he yeah. acts, yeah. Yeah. So the second metaphor, divine condescension. Herablasung, meaning to basically be in a position of authority, be superior in knowledge and power, but to leave that and sit on the ground like a mother does with her baby. Mm-hmm. This is what the triune God does for the benefit of human beings without showing off to them and patronizing them in any way. Well, unless you're a religious leader. <laughs> the paradigm for this is the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Even though the human race wanted to ascend into heaven on the Tower of Reason to make a great name for itself, the triune God descends from heaven to earth to meet with them there. His condescension is the only means by which they can approach him. There you go. Right. Isn't that the psalmist? Like, um, I can descend to the deepest parts of the earth and right. you are there and go to the right. highest peaks. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, the cosmology of Genesis is that there are three heavens, and this persists throughout the history of Israel. There's mm-hmm. the sky, the first heaven, there's the stars, the second heaven, and then there's the third heavens, which is the throne room of God. Right. And so if you look at old pictures, old depictions of earth and the heavens and the underworld, there's three circles. Yeah. Let me try to yep. find an old picture. Oh, yeah. Here's, oh, I got to turn off the light, probably. It's probably going to be blurry, but you get it there. And God's up. It's yep, there you go. Yep. He's up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. Yep. So that's why God condescends. He comes from the third heavens to the first heavens from the sky to us. So when people say, well, Jesus ascended into the heavens, where did he go? Well, he went back to the throne room, which is the third heaven. But that's why I like the depiction there from, I don't know if that's Cronach or whoever, but mm-hmm. that, you know, but he's surrounding everything. So yes. it's not like he's gone. He's still... Yeah. He's still he's like, if you like right. the bishop, right? He's the overseer. Mm-hmm. In with yeah. and under. Yeah. Yeah. So the Bible tells, which again, as a complete aside, it's really hard in the present tense to take serious anything that the Bible says about cosmology when we reject all of it. 
<laughs> and I don't mean that in like I'm rejecting it. I'm saying in the present tense, when people come to the church and you teach this stuff, yeah, their entire cosmology is the opposite of what the scriptures, and by the way, all cultures up to the modernity present as cosmology. It's not just Israel that presents this cosmology. It's in every it's everything. It's everywhere. And I always find that interesting that, you know, where did Jesus go? Well, he ascended into the skies, into the heavens. Well, where did he go after that? Well, he's at the right hand of the Father. Well, that's not a real place, right? It's like, well, according to the modern cosmology, yeah, it's not a real place. According to the ancient cosmology, he literally ascends to the right hand of the Father, although it's the Father is It's spirit. as real as here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like C.S. Lewis says, he didn't just descend from the sky like a parachute man and just <laughs> drop in on us. He's not right. D.B. Well, Cooper. This is why, I don't know, it resonates with you. It, I know it does with me, you know, just thinking about um, time and, and mm -hmm. light and relativity right. you know, from Einstein. It was like, or manner, manner or mode of being, right? Right. But it's not like less present, just mm -hmm. not present in the same way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, that's a whole conversation, but. It is. <laughs> so divine condescension. The son, so the Father in creation, God the Son in his incarnation, and God the Holy Spirit in the inspiration of the Bible. In his notes on how to interpret the scriptures, Haman maintains, quote, the inspiration of this book is as great an act of self-effacement and condescension as the creation of the world by the Father and the incarnation of the Son. <laughs> One of the things that Jürgen Moltmann, who's kind of a boogeyman that we may read someday, but I read him because I was forced to. Also canceled. Um, is that... Moltmann points out in the East, in Trinitarian theology in the East, God makes space for creation because God is in all and fills all things and is all things and there is no, there's God. And therefore there is no room for anything else to exist because God is all in all. So for God to create earth and the heavens, he has to make space, which in the East then is again, what, he's, what Haman's describing, which is God's condescension is that he creates out of nothing but he mm -hmm. first has to create that space to create. And that in and of itself is a sacrifice for God. And then likewise then for God to become a man and to always, and then say, well, I, uh, from the beginning of creation, this is my identity, the lamb who's sacrificed. Right. Like I, there was never a time that I did not intend to take on flesh so that I might die. It's like, what? <laughs> what? And then you profound. realize yeah. Paul is saying that based on his interpretation and reading of the Old Testament, the scriptures. And you're like, okay, so let me get this straight. When you read the book of Moses, you come to the conclusion that God has always been the lamb who sacrificed from the beginning. He always intended to become flesh and blood. It's always been part of the plan. Right. Because when I read it, I don't, I'm not, and this goes back to your earlier point, if the Holy Spirit doesn't inspire Paul to say that, that ain't happening. That isn't right. even written down. But now in reverse, what ends up happening is you go back and you right. see, oh, wait a minute, all these uh, many and various ways that God has mm -hmm. revealed himself to his people, mm -hmm. you know, burning bush, pillar of cloud, yeah. pillar of fire, it's all showing right. that God will be among his people. Right. Right. And then, of course, right. the height of that is to come in the image of right. man, right. which is made in God's image, right? Right. Reflexively. Which in and of itself hmm. shows that God operates outside the law. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because he doesn't obey his own rules. <laughs> I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but. Well, I mean. He came in the flesh. <laughs> but it's whose the, rule is that? Exactly. Right. That God can't die. It's ours. Right. Yeah. Right. It's or that he can't law. promise. It's our rule. Just that like he can't, the, be, yeah. can't be the son of David or, or mm -hmm. the son of Eve, right? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Which again, the entire cosmology of the scriptures, we were like, no, that's all just mythological, fantastic nonsense because they were a bunch of just ignorant savages who didn't know anything. Oh, and on the other hand, we actually believe that God became flesh and blood, died and rose from the dead. I like, like the idea. I like the idea. I know it's a little bit uh, speculative mm -hmm. or maybe a lot, but mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's su such a radical idea that not even <laughs> the angels knew it. Yeah. And so they can't help but break out in a song at the birth even of Christ. Even angels and be like, seek to know these things. Yeah. It's like, what? Yeah. Things that, oh, things that angels dare to look into, right? Yes. Isn't that how it says? Yeah. 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 It's like, wow. Yeah. It, it, that, it's that revolutionary, that um, unthinkable. Right. Mm. So, for example, then Haman claims that God the Father was pleased to see himself humbled together with other, the other persons of the Trinity by his condemnation of his son in our place and the bestowal of his righteousness and holiness on us. 
so that there is now no condemnation for us. Hmm. I, I think what, what is great about these quotes that the Kleining is drawing out for us is it's drawing out for me at least how complacent we can become with God's word when we read yeah, it right, and not right. recognize this is so radically different than the way that we think that you either have to explain it away as mythological nonsense invented by a bunch of ignorant people who lived before microscopes and telescopes, or we are so in denial about reality that, mm. that in the entirety of human history is simply, again, a fight against the truth. I, I made this remark uh, to another pastor, not to the presenter yesterday, but as we were looking at the book of Hebrews, and the presenter is presenting things that are very, um, well, they were well defended ideas, but they're mm -hmm. they're kind of radical, right? And and they're and they're <coughs> new, and and so the question is like, um, well, why are you willing to go there? And mm -hmm. nobody has, not even Luther. I mean, the, yeah. they just like disc they just relied upon previous mm -hmm. scholarship efforts. Right. You know, in the book of Hebrews, you're looking at the counsels, you know, the the canons in, uh, of the councils, mm -hmm. right, where they determined that Hebrews was anti legomena it was spoken yeah. against, and they agreed to include it, but with that caveat, yeah, right. And then Luther just kind of runs with that, like he does with James, yeah. right. And, and then over his lifetime, James, he's right. like, James is edifying; it's useful. Mm -hmm. So, right. But uh, in the in the commentary on Hebrews, just as a side, mm -hmm. that's actually that in the Magnificat in Psalm 118 are where Luther works out further his statement at Heidelberg about what makes a theologian the cross. Mm, okay. It's his commentary on the letter to the Hebrews, and it's a very small commentary, by the way. It's one of the yeah, briefest yeah. of all of them. But that's where he works out what a theologian of the cross is. I'm just talking about his like preface to the book yeah. um, in the German Bible. Where, I mean, and, and I understand that. So now we get a presenter who says, no, this is actually canon. This is, mm -hmm. this is it might have been anti-legomena, but it doesn't deserve to be classified that way. Sure. And here's why. Hmm. And you're looking at, at, at what what is very clear, um, I think, presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it'll take some work to maybe defend a little bit yet, right. but but you look at it and like, well, why did nobody else do this? And it's exactly this point mm -hmm. that Haman's willing to just go there, like right. to, to let his let the creative imagination go. Mm -hmm. You know, test it against the rest of Scripture, right? I mean, yeah. not every idea is going to be valid or true, right. right? But but ask those questions. Just ask like children do mm -hmm. <laughs> when they ask. Well, like, what about why did the why did God allow, you know, Elijah to or send the she bears to maul these kids? I mean, that right. seems a little bit like, mm -hmm. and they just asked the question. They're like, this is kind of a weird story and it's kind of cool, but yeah. it's also like, it's kind of outrageous. And we need you to know ask that, these questions. That text is an outer range. I know it is. It literally I just popped got to that up episode like a day last after night. You talked to me about it and then it popped up in outer range. I was like, whoa. That right. Is and then wild. we wild. I just watched it last night. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why it's fresh on my mind, too. Mm -hmm. and it was a but, perfect text for but the, the context of the movie. The way that the TV show works out. Mm -hmm. That let you're like oh that's really nice because you haven't yeah. seen what she what happens yet with the bear no no it's the next episode yeah. well she took the bear into the into the shed but I haven't seen right the next episode and yet. yeah no it, yeah it gets I'm like weirder. well what's she gonna do with that bear that, we're talking about outer weird. range it's on Amazon Prime stars Josh Brolin I love we it. talked about it last week I just burned through that in like three days it's so good I don't know where it's gonna go but but the, regardless me, of that no don't even try it because no. yeah it's fantastic. Well. But it, uh, it's, to, it's to Jared's point. It wasn't Jared said we want to do an episode on time? Yeah. yeah. Well, that show, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah, time mm -hmm. is a... It turns out you can to... just throw stuff into a hole and, and make it go away. <laughs> <laughs> Not if Kronos ripped it into the... Right, it just keeps into the fabric coming of time back. And space. Yeah. Yeah. So God was humiliated by the shameful death of his only begotten son for their sin at the instigation... Oh, this is great. So I'm going to go back. <laughs> so good. Okay. I'm going to refresh while you do that. Okay. God condescended in the creation of Adam. God, as it were, got his hands and mouth dirty by forming him from clay and breathing his own life breath into him. He interacts with people through people. He condescended to engage personally in his conversation with Abraham in Genesis 18 in order to satisfy his desire for a son, instruct him in his own will, and make him an intercessor. With Jacob, he condescended to comply with Jacob's conditions for his acceptance of him as his God without requiring any commitment from him until he had earned the right to it by blessing Jacob with earthly possessions. But above all else, God condescended by sending his Son and the Holy Spirit as his gifts for all people, so that God was humiliated by the shameful death of his only begotten Son for their sin at the instigation of the devil, as well as by the proclamation of his murdered Son as the Prince of Life through the Twelve Apostles. This is like a sermon. God, 
Yeah, and I'm thinking about um, one of the things I love about Kleinig is that he doesn't shy away from um, less than popular words if it mm-hmm. is if it is the most appropriate term. Yeah, like condescension. Does, <laughs> yeah, but he also does this with submission. Yeah, yeah. right. He'll translate it as subordinate, which sure. kind of helps, right? Sometimes, but um, but to submit or to be subordinate, and then to work it out and just say your problem with the statement isn't the word itself. Mm-hmm. It's that you don't understand what's being said. And condescension yeah. comes off as sound, sounding like, right, it's it's just like humiliation is yeah. another one. Well, we right? only use it in the negative nowadays. Right, right, right. Hmm. Right, and so here he's like, no, this is the right word to translate whatever Haman wrote in German. I don't know what the mm-hmm. German was, right? But because it's, it's this attitude of, you know, in the negative sense, it's the mm-hmm. attitude of patronizing superiority, disdain, Yeah. yeah. right? But this is this is the opposite. And you look in. The, I'm looking in the dictionary. They they don't have a positive definition of the word. They don't use a positive definition of it. Right. Right. As as it as the act of of mm-hmm. humility of greatest humility. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Which yeah, again? Nobody. Not not at all. None in, none of the English def- dictionaries again, it's here. It's just a part of our war on God. Just to take a good, perfectly good word and mm-hmm. turn Twisting it into, into the something negative. negative. Yeah. Wasn't well, that well, that's what we were talking about with like marriage, family, mm-hmm. yeah, children, everything, everything, yep. Um, even things like uh, naivete, right? To be naive mm-hmm. is actually a good thing, <laughs> yeah, when yeah. you're a child, yeah, 100%. Right? Innocent, no, mm. it's very interesting. I was talking with a brother pastor about this that the more that he is shown, and I'm a part of that, the more despondent he becomes. And I keep asking him the question, when you read scriptures and you preach on scriptures and you teach on scriptures, and I give him the quotes and I give him the catechism references, and you, you, I know you are faithful. I know that you teach and preach on these things. What do you think you're saying? Have you never thought about what you're saying? And the answer that I get in return is, I don't think I have actually, Mm -mm. because I've never thought about this before. I've never seen this before. Well, like I was saying with Inception, you might break break through the one dream, but you don't right. get out of the next level right. and the other right. level and right. the other level. You know, all of the, I mean, it's it's the layering of lies like right. an onion, right? Right. And you don't but get to the core of the thing. When you're enthralled and bewitched and enchanted by the world, by Satan in particular, you're programmed. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, when the illusion is shattered and you and you see, oh, it's not just Jesus versus sin, death, and Satan, but it's literally Jesus versus sin, death, and Satan, and they're real. And they're not metaphors and they don't just pop up occasionally. Like I've encountered evil over here or I've seen the work of the devil. No, it's one systematic campaign throughout all of time and history to deny the creator altogether, not in pieces, not in parts, not here or there, but all together. I mean, the enemy's enemies always at the gate, always always lying in wait. Always, Mm -hmm. always. Yeah, always looking for opportunity. And I think modern Christians have been lulled asleep since the 50s because we were given a place of pride in the public square. We were treated as if our uh, opinion mattered, if being yeah. a good Christian was important, and yet we were bewitched because what and was denied. And infiltrated. Yeah. Infiltrated. We were infiltrated by antichrists. And what was denied? Original sin, the efficacy of the sacraments, and the denial of free will. Mm-hmm. Right? Or dis- the discipline of prayer. Discipline of prayer was negated. Family was negated. Mm-hmm. It was all negated through the church. And like we talked about at the very, you know, when we were talking about this earlier in the episode, it's, it's one thing to look at celebrity or to look at politics or to look at society in general or the culture wars and say, obviously that's satanic. But when it comes in the form of godliness and it comes into the churches as godliness, as love for the neighbor, it's so deceptive because it, it it appeals to quote unquote, our better angels. Right. Because we want to be good people. We want to be caring people. We don't want to be seen as bad people. So if you can appeal to people's emotions on that level, it's not that hard to get people to do what you want. Yeah. I mean, despite the the uh, intuitiveness of it, and mm-hmm. it's intuitive because of the flesh, uh, you know, a moral, upright group of people right. um, are not going to be preserved. They're not going to last. Right. Right. And you're like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. If they're all living a you know a pious, good life, mm-hmm. then that community is going to last. Right. I was like, well, no, that's the deception of it. Right. Right. Because of course, right. uh, what would be a good a good uh, popular illustration of this? Oh, like Mad Men. Mm-hmm. Right. 
is that the progression of that show at the beginning everything's done in secret behind yeah. and by the end by the time you get to the 70s it's like it's all brought out all into in the, the open, open. exactly yeah. but by in the 50s portion of the show and, at the beginning, and how does don draper end up after everything where he started yeah you know yeah the abandoned son of you know mm -hmm. of a, a his mother was a prostitute right yeah, yeah. sitting on a prayer mat in hawaii <laughs> <laughs> so that's God the Father. Now the Son condescended to engage with people on earth by his incarnation as a man and his death on the cross. Since that is the heart of the matter, Haman focuses his attention on it with this challenge. Quote, consider how God the Son has humbled himself. One, he became a man, became the least of all people, took on the form of a servant. He became the most hapless of them. He was made sin for us. In God's eyes, he was the sinner of the whole people, unquote. I like that word hapless. He keeps using the word hapless. I like that. It's a good yeah, word. Maybe it's an Australian word. Do they use that in Australia? Hapless? No, it's an old American word. No. Oh, I mean, this is, Kleinig. word. this is Kleinig's translation. So. True. I just like Luckless, that word. unfortunate. Yeah. That's, that's been, I've heard a, a political commentary guy use that describing the current um, uh, mock presidency that mm. we have, right? Yeah. Is calling it hapless, calling yeah. the, the, the even the president hapless. It's like, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's true. I mean, we have to, we have to. What is that? It's almost lamenting, right? Yeah. It's like, because it's elder abuse. You put this right. person in place that's just, well, at least the one that that usually plays the president mm -hmm. <laughs> is is very sad. It's yeah. very sad. Yeah, yeah, unlucky, ill fated, however you mm -hmm. want to describe it, hapless. So Jesus, mm. the son could not go any lower than that for us. And it was all for our benefit. He humbled himself to exalt us, to raise us up. Haman gives this graphic account of that great exchange. And here it is. Quote, as the God who condescended to be like us in every way, had no place where he could lay his head and did not enjoy the comforts that the animals looked for in their nests and their holes. So the man had to be raised above all finite creatures, exalted and glorified in God himself. God became a son of man and an heir of his curse and death and fate so that the man would become a son of God and only heir of heaven, as closely united with God as the fullness of divinity dwelt bodily in Christ. Unquote. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of scripture uh, reference every, I was there. going to say, every paragraph from Haman is like a Thanksgiving meal. Mm -hmm. I'm just full. Right, and that's... This was going to be the problem of discussing the book on the show. There's the book. Yeah. Um, is Other because it's expense. just like, well, yeah, it's fifty five dollars on sale right now. Um, because it's nugget, it's nuggets, 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 nuggets. It's just a little thing. It's like, well, yeah. we can't do a whole show on just that, right? Right. But then you could read that, and it's like, I mean, it'd be good for like, um, mm, kind of like, kind of like the Daily Stoic readers, right? Yeah. You know, just you know, read a page or something. Uh, you know, on his mm -hmm. meditations on a read the text and then read yeah. the, read his meditation and then you know consider it maybe journal it yourself a little bit, see where it takes you. Is the majority of the book like that? Yeah, majority of it, right? Yeah. So it's is it is it written in chapter form? Is it more like no, like um, it's Aurelius's just, meditations? Well, it, it's been organized by the book, the books that he's reading through. So mm -hmm. you so it does go sequentially through like chronicles. But I'm just saying, like it's not like 15 pages of a thought and then next chapter. It's more like uh, no, like for example, on Genesis one, five, eight, and ten. Here's the here's the thought. God named italicized. Mm -hmm. Here, the use of the first names and words are ascribed to God. Mm. That's it. Just an idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or Genesis one twenty abundantly. So then he has a little thing on abundantly. Okay. This abundance is decreed especially for the waters. The fulfillment of the divine command is in the next verse. The abundance hmm. is still evident in nature. Well, now that is profound. If you think abundant is described of the waters, because then baptism, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you can see where it could take you. Then you yeah, can think right. about that. How much is that book on Amazon? Uh, not on Amazon. Buy it direct from the publisher. You can get it on Amazon, but it's cheaper with the publisher. It's fifty five, so it's twenty percent off. Yeah. I mean it, it's kinda and like we what we had a link for that in the show notes. Yep. Good. It's kinda like what we had from um then he has a whole bit about interpreting hymns and then also his like personal life, the course That's of his right. life. That's right. You told me about the interpreting hymns thing, which got my attention. Yeah. yeah. Well we might want to look at that. I don't know. Um but the what was I gonna say about this? I still have uh continuing ed money that I have to spend. Oh, I got you. So yeah, I got you. No, it's kind of like uh, like we had with Vile, you know, where it's like mm -hmm. a one-page thing. 
Nice. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Simone Vile, for those of you wondering. Not Kurt. We did it. How many episodes <laughs> did we did? Three oh, episodes, maybe? At least three, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this emphasis on the condescension of God's son is not unique to Haman. It is quite in keeping with his Lutheran heritage. Even though that teaching was largely ignored by his contemporaries, who had no interest in and little comprehension of such paradoxes. <laughs> well, exactly. The self-effacement and condescension of the Father in creation and of the Son in the incarnation corresponds with the condescension of the Spirit in the inspiration of the Bible. This emphasis comes in large part from Haman himself. He makes it part of his Trinitarian confession of faith in his biographical sketch where he says, quote, I confess that for us the Holy Spirit has published a book for his word, in which like a fool or a madman, yes, like an unholy and unclean spirit, he turned proud reasons, children's stories, trivial, contemptible events into the history of heaven and God. Oh, that's great. Isn't it? Yeah, that's cool. Let me go back to Jared's point on the live stream about, you know, if we were going to write a fiction, a fictional account of God. Yeah. <laughs> and yet God out fictionalizes us by saying, hey, you want to know a secret? The truth is stranger than fiction. Well, and that, you know, if you read like, oh, I don't know, maybe like Peter's interactions in the gospel, mm -hmm. you know, and they're comically, I mean, laughable. Yeah. But they're eminently relatable, right? Right. It's like, yeah. no, I understand Peter's kind of like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll put yeah. on my outer garment and jump into the lake and try to swim to the 100%. shore. <laughs> right. Like you're an, but he's joy. Yeah. He's, he's like a child. He's like, yeah. oh, there's Jesus. And, you know, the whole putting on the outer garment is probably symbolic. But, but right. regardless, it's like, you know, just to be so overjoyed to have found Jesus by the yeah. Sea of Galilee again, right. like at the beginning of the story. Yep. You know, and then to swim to shore. And it's just like, okay, I get it. <laughs> You're just like really excited. He explains that further in this way, quote, consider how low God the Holy Spirit has condescended by becoming a historian of the smallest, most contemptible, most insignificant incidents on earth, so as to reveal the mysteries and ways of God to mankind in its own speech in its own history, and in its own ways. Hmm. In a completely tasteless reversal of expectations, the Holy Spirit chooses to reveal the things of God physically and vernacularly, meaning in our own language that we can understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He discloses the highest mysteries to ordinary people in a lowly way, with what seems trivial and insignificant, foolish and insane, dishonorable and despicable to his critics. This is so key, because I thought about this. We talk about sometimes where pastors get this disease, this mental affliction, which is they're going to turn their, their congregation into mini seminaries, and then hmm. they treat their Bible studies as mini seminary classes and their sermons like lecture hall lectures. And What do you if, mean by that? Like very organized thought? or Well, it's just like I'm the professor and you're the students, and I'm here to prepare you for the world out there. Right. To unload on you the full counsel of God. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But with many words and much usage of Latin and German and Hebrew and, you know, Greek and you, like in the Greek, this word means this. And you're like, pastor, it's Sunday morning. It's 1030. I just, just please. Sometimes that's effective. Sometimes. Sometimes. Right. Rarely. Um, and again, be terse and get to the point and use a good illustration. So, Instead, what he's saying, though, is, listen, what the Holy Spirit has done with the Bible is so tasteless <laughs> as far as our expectations, but so <clears throat> grounded in our vernacular, right. uses analogies of farming, of war, of sport, like Paul does. Right, but think, but think about the relationship, describing the relationship of God's people mm -hmm. in, in terms of of a bride and a bridegroom or exactly. in the opposite case, right? right? I mean, all right. the language of, of whoredom and you're like, no, yeah, you, you can't use that picture right. of Jesus. I can't like talk about it with the kids, right. you know? But that's the key point right there. You yeah. can't talk about this in polite company and the Holy Spirit saying, I literally gave you the language and the images and the analogies to use in polite conversation. This mm -hmm. is how you're supposed to be talking. And we're like, that's not how Christians talk. According to the Holy Spirit, that's exactly how we're supposed to talk. Right, right. So even the way in which we teach and preach as pastors is an open rebellion against what he's describing right here, which is the language of the Holy Spirit. The, like the, the softening of the language. Exactly. To make it either digestible or palatable. Yes. That's the right exactly. word. 
palatable. Trivial, insignificant, foolish, insane, dishonorable, despicable to his critics. And that's how he translates the language of God and the angels in heaven into humble, vulgar human discourse. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that's not how God wants us. That's not proper. That's not how God wants us to talk. Clean it up. And God's saying, dude, the very fact that I'm even talking to you this way at all is condescension. Right. Like I had right. to humble myself to... Right. And, yet, and it is if, for your benefit, right? I mean, it's that's for the your point. benefit. So if you're going to talk anyway, talk the way that I talk. You don't need Which, to go to the, and you don't need to go even probably to the rabbi or no. to the prophet or whatever to understand no. these words. You don't need an interpreter. We do this with the Lord's Prayer. Jesus commands, when you pray, pray this way. Mm -hmm. And then we interpret what that means in the context of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And yet, what Haman is saying is that all of Scripture, all that is breathed into being by the Holy Spirit, is how God wants us to talk about Him to others. Or and then how we he say, talks. Yeah. God, I don't know if you're familiar with how we talk and our colloquialisms and idioms and the vernacular, but that's not the proper way to talk about you know you and us. Right. God's saying, that's exactly how I want you to talk. Let me give you this example, because right. it struck me when I was looking up that pharmacia stuff yesterday. This is from mm -hmm. Isaiah 47. He says, come, he's talking to Babylon, right? Yeah. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. For you shall be no more called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and the grind meal. Remove your veil. Take off your skirt. Uncover the thigh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. Pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Your shame will be seen. I will take vengeance. I will not arbitrate with a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. <laughs> this is what like chapter is that? 47. 47. Yeah, and then he gets to the bit about how they're how she's aborting her children again. Mm -hmm. And then Pharmacy. trying to take yeah. trying to take magic portions to be fertile again. That's why I was looking at it. And it's like, oh. It's like, wait a minute, you can't, like, how am I going to explain this to kids? Take off okay. your skirt and uncover your thigh? To your point, yeah. then, because this is fun, right? And this mm -hmm. is why I like Peterson's translation. So oh, you're going to read I, it? Okay. Yeah, All right. here's Isaiah yeah. 47 from uh, Eugene Peterson's translation. Get off your high horse and sit in the dirt, virgin daughter of Babylon. No more throne for you. Sit on the ground, daughter of the Chaldeans. Nobody will be calling you charming and alluring anymore. Get used to it. Get a job, any old job. Clean gutters, scrub toilets, pawn your gowns and scarves, put on your working pants. The party is over. <laughs> your nude body will be on public display, exposed to vulgar taunts. It's vengeance time, and I am taking vengeance, and no one gets let off the hook. <laughs> yeah, it's evocative. Our, yeah, right? But that's what I mean. I really appreciate Peterson's take on that. Because again, it's just what Pearson is trying to get at is the spirit of the text and say, listen, in the vernacular of when I'm translating this, this is how we talk. Right. And if I were living in the, in the generation of Isaiah, this, and if, if Isaiah were alive today, this is how this would come out. This is what it mm -hmm. would sound like. Right, right. Not right. polite, not wooden or quote unquote literal, which I think is really just our, again, code for protecting the text from, you know, protecting us from the text. Well, there is a literal text, yet. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But we're not Hebrew. We... We're not Hebrew people of, uh, right. you know, Isaiah's day. Right. Exactly. So you just look at it and you say to yourself, okay, I got to translate this. I want to capture the spirit. I want to capture the, the f as my professor said, Why the force. Why don't you just force... flip it? I want the spirit to capture me. <laughs> exactly. But um, Nestigan always called it the force of exegesis. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was referring to Jesus interpreting himself. Mm-hmm that there's a force to exegesis, there's a force in the word. And what we try to do is remove that force and like you said, soften the language, make it appreciable in polite society, right? We don't want the white suburban housewives to be offended by the way that we speak in church. Right, and I, and I understand that, you know, the public mm -hmm. assembly and the scandal Absolutely. of it. I mean, however, uh, however, yeah. We're talking about death and new life and God being the author of death and life. I make wheel and I make woe. I lead down into death and I raise up to life. Right. And then and we, I, we, how I mean, do you the, soften that? Well, and I, w I was thinking about this with some pastors this, uh, this week when it came to prayer. Because mm -hmm. we, were we were talking about just this flippant thing where they, they, they had their little prayer services, right? And they, they, offered, uh, they offered intercession for the, for the governor and the president by name. Which yeah. of course causes offense to some of the people in the room sure. who don't actually 
believe. Not my president. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Right. And like, why are you calling this guy by name? And I was like, my point is, why aren't we, Right. if we're truly angry, if we're Mm -hmm. actually like, why, why are we not calling God to curse? Yeah. To curse him. I mean, yeah. For, for his rebellion against God's order, the order that right. he set up, right? Right. And we, we, we're we not, well, we can't do that because there's some people who don't, I'm like, okay. So <laughs> right. we've we've lost, I mean, we've even lost the ability to pray in the way no, of, of, course of the because, scriptures. Yeah. We become Because statists. of that softening. That's yeah. softening. Well, no, that's softening, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I have this old prayer book that I use for Wednesday nights because mm-hmm. we do like feasts and festivals. So I did yeah. like Philip and James last night. Mm-hmm. I don't. Remember, I don't know who published it. It was before. It was during the synodical conference, yeah. but it has like like two page prayers for mm-hmm. all the festivals. Yeah, it's a red book. I don't know. Right. It wasn't. It wasn't CPH, mm-hmm. and it does this actually. Mm-hmm. You know, it says that those who have usurped their office, let them yeah. be overthrown. For example. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, could we not pray that? And yeah. it's all in King James language, which is probably why nobody yeah. uses it anymore. <clears throat> it's like, no, if that's actually what you believe, that's how you need to pray. Not just Correct. say, oh, just bless his work. You know, like, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? And so this is the way the prophets do it. But you know, you know the reason you don't do it, because there's going to be somebody in the room that's going to get offended that you right. e- even oh, I insinuated. Know, I, I added the imprecatory psalms back into our liturgy. And I mm-hmm. use them for the introit. <laughs> <laughs> and I make the congregation confess them with me. And I've by the had way, comments. By the way, your criti- criticisms of uh, pastoral conferences, we pray matins and vespers, but there was no psalmody. Mm-hmm. There you and go. I was like, there you go. I'm like, hmm, why, aren't we, why can't we? I mean, I, I don't mind only singing one hymn. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But you drop the psalm. Yeah. No. <laughs> you don't, you're not. And, and we're a bunch of pastors. We can't pray two psalms or three. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what's happened here? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, we got to move on to the conference business. There hmm. we go. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Hmm. Hmm. Fun. Hmm. Judgment. Good times. Good times. Now I'm going to get put on the committee because somebody's going to listen to this. That's right. Be like, oh, we need that guy on the committee because he knows what to do. It wouldn't be Christmas without some sweaty balls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, SNL classics. Um, so he vulgar discloses, human discourse. Vulgar human discourse. God acts in this way because he does not want to communicate information about himself to satisfy the idle curiosity of philosophers. There it is. Thank you. Boom. What is Erasmus's whole project? It is. Christian philosophy. He calls it that. Yeah. I'm all about the ethics of the Christian, he says. The high moral like, teachings. The Holy Spirit that, is not a Christian yeah. philosopher. These are That's oil and water. No. It's like I said, it's like someone giving you a chocolate and you're like, ooh, I got a chocolate. And then you bite into it and there's Pepto Bismol in the middle. And you're like, that's what did you what did you do? That's a terrible illustration. That's terrible. That's what I'm saying. Is like that's like someone giving you a piece of chocolate and you're like, ooh, chocolate, I wonder what's in the middle. And then it's Pepto Bismol in the middle. It's like, ugh. Isn't that like, what they used to do with Jesus like the pills? Then... They chocolate coat them, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking Princess Bride. <laughs> that too. Yeah, that's right. He's not he's not completely dead. Uh, true love. So he uses human words as a physical means of grace to rescue imprisoned people, enlighten blind souls, and confound proud unbelievers. Right. And I'm thinking of Luther Small called famous statement, right? Even an eight year old mm-hmm. or seven year old or whatever it is knows yeah. what the church is, you know, mm-hmm. sheep under their shepherd. Yeah. You know, and it's like, no. so, I mean, that's the point. Yeah. It's like the scripture that, not, never mind just the central truths. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't, there's nothing in the Bible that I don't read with the kids. We just read, like, we'll read yeah. through a book. And right. and you know mm-hmm. that there's parents in the room, adults mm-hmm. in the room, who are like, this not is not relevant, not appropriate, not relevant. They can't understand it. I'm like, well, if you don't mm-hmm. open it up to them, that's true. But right. they understand the bare meaning of the words. They understand what's going right. on. They understand the narrative direction, well, you know. Back to they even earlier, hear the themes. Yeah. They understand these things. Back to our earlier point about, you know, I use the example of, of an older child talking to my 10-year-old about sexual things, and my 10-year-old just like, what? Yeah. Notice that God always gives context for mm-hmm. what he's talking about, even the sexually explicit stuff in Isaiah 47. Mm-hmm. Like, he still provides an explanation of, like, this is why this isn't good. <laughs> right. So I mean, he's teaching, he's children. actually teaching about adultery, Sixth Commandment, yes, but in terms is. of Babylon... And exactly. their exile and these yes. these foreign gods or which, mm-hmm. whatever illustration, yeah. yeah, right. And I actually that's how I teach children. the The command is I say, when you go into your mom and dad's bedroom in the morning, who's in bed? 
They're like, my mom and dad. I'm like, great. I said, what if you came in your bedroom tomorrow morning and it was your dad and your mother's sister? Would you be like, hey, mom and dad? And you'd be like, no, of course not. That's gross. I'm like, that's adultery. Correct. If there's anybody in your mom and dad's bed other than your mom and dad, that's adultery. It's also and idolatry. If you need more, <laughs> it's also idolatry. But I'm just like, and if you need more explanation, talk to your mom and dad about it. You know, I'm your yeah. pastor and I just need to explain this to you simply, but I also don't want to shatter your childish naivety yet because the world's way prepared and ready to do that for you. I don't need to do that for you. Yeah, but the book of nature tells you that that, 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 yes. that would be a cause of shame or... Exactly. It's, yeah. It's, the kids know that inherently, that that's not right. No. And I have plenty of kids that have one parent. They so also they see, understand. Same yeah, thing. All sorts uh, well, of things. when I go into the bedroom in the morning, there's only mom or dad in bed. Or how come dad's in the basement and mom's upstairs? That's another one. Or there's this other guy that comes over. Or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. you know, and that gets weird. But they understand inherently. Like, I don't even have to explain, like, I don't have to provide context when I say, when you go into your mom and dad's bedroom in the morning, who's in the bed? And then they'll throw that out. Usually it's mom and dad, but sometimes it is mom and her boyfriend, or it's just my dad or just my mom. And I'm like, okay, based on the explanation of the catechism and what you just said. You may like, end we, up with uh, children calling their parents to repentance. They do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> they do. It yeah, would be that's, dishonorable that's for them not. They stop coming to confirmation sometimes. Mm hmm. But the nice thing right. is, I keep it simple so that when I'm called on it by the parents, I can repeat back to the parents. This is exactly what I said. Yeah, I say right. it every year. I teach it the exact same way every time. It took me a long time to come up with this explanation, so it's that I good. Would, I haven't know, heard that from you before. I'm, yeah, just, maybe I was in that bed too. in the morning. Yeah. So, do you want to stop there with that paragraph, or do you want to? What does dive he go to? The... I don't even know what he goes to. That's probably a good place. Well, it oh, just, no, Talmon explains this the most vividly in his notes on the interpretation of the Bible, which introduces his London writings. And then oh, he, he gives us instances. more examples of these. So, yeah. It would almost be better to come back because I'm like, I'm about neck it's deep time. now in my thoughts on what we just read. <laughs> and we could definitely talk for at least another right. two hours just on what we read. Well, and this is great because it's Haman, but it's also Kleinig. Yeah. You're getting both because Kleinig agrees with Haman. So, so shout getting... out to John Kleinig, by the way. For doing this outstanding work. Outstanding job, yeah. Well, because you and he, I he, both have seen Haman's work, not, <laughs> it, not, not translated kindly. <laughs> like you read, well, like, especially oh, the heavy, heavy duty yes, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I said, so, the last episode. Shout out to John Kleinig for doing the heavy work of translating. So this. let's see, where, where, what time are we at? We are. I've got do two eleven. Wanna, do we want to split this in two? Or next week? I, I'm traveling again. I could record on split Thursday it. again, or we, we could do could, that. Either way, you, you want to do that? Yeah. Let's come back to it on Thursday. Yeah. All right, because I'm that. traveling on Friday again. So. Good, good, good. All right, everybody. Well, thank you to everyone on the live stream again. Thank you to everybody at 1517 and all of our listeners for all you do to support this podcast and what we do here. And uh, yeah, come back next week. There'll be a new episode. And um, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, right? right? What else is there to say? I don't know. Jesus wins. There you go. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Peace. Jesus <laughs> Crash and burn. Yeah. Hey, when it's done. Downshift, downshift. You hit, you hit your wall. It's done. It's good. Yeah. Oh, stop recording. I lost. That's... I, I, I it, my internet flipped over to the cell, and you didn't. But you didn't tell me I was blocky all the time. So. Well, I didn't realize that you're gonna get blocked. Usually, it just kind of comes in and out, and then. No. It resolves so itself. what? It, what happened is it reverted me over to the cellular connection. Mm, and I then, also forgot but to it stop kept my syncing. So. Uh huh. And then it kept me on the cellular connection, even oh. when the main connection was restored, because it didn't want to. So that's why I had to refresh in the middle there, so hmm. you could see me again. Oh well. Nice. Well, I'm like I said, I'm a, I've got my uh, builder in the congregation gonna build out my podcasting studio at home. So I look at you. With that. Look well, at I just you. Need, I just I want to I want to actually. You know how this is with like your gym, right? It needs to be right. Yes. Otherwise, it's not it's not pleasant to work in. If it's not clean or yes. if it's not organized or if things aren't yes. in the right place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? absolutely. You, you just, and or if the color's not right or if the light, lighting's not working Anything. or whatever. Yep. Yeah, otherwise yeah, you absolutely. can't work. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. So, awesome. I have Good. to record another podcast after I eat lunch. Me too. Me too. Because I made a, just, my brain was stuttering yesterday, so I recorded my podcast and I got done. I was like, nope, not good enough. Come there back tomorrow. It happens. I should have listened to myself the first time.
what I was like, take yeah. the day off, rest. Yeah, that's all right. So, cool. You got, you'll, you'll hit it better the second time. Maybe. Of course. So, no, that's fantastic. There's so many sermon things in here. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's why I thought that introduction where he just summarizes it is better mm -hmm. with the quotes. Yeah. Because the quotes are good, but it's like, yeah. good luck finding that through those 200 pages. Yeah. You know, unless you're intentionally <laughs> looking at it. But mm -hmm. if you were going to like read along, like if you were reading through Nehemiah, you could have his open and say, ooh. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's much like Leia does uh, with the aphorisms. Yeah. It's aphorismic, right? Isn't that the word? I think that's the yeah. word. Yeah, aphorismic. Mm hmm So it's just like, I mean, the, the stuff on Job is pretty big, actually. These are long nice. paragraphs. Satan borrows the terrors of nature so as to make his judgment on Job so much more well, impressive. It's hmm. a good point. Actually, to go back to the book of nature, yeah. Satan uses the book of nature against us because he can't use the book of God. No, Satan waits, seems to wait for the effect of his miracles. Or I should say, Satan can only use half of the book of God against us because he can't use the promise, but he can use all of the book of nature against us. Satan seems to take such an interest in the government of this world in order to mislead people by their faith in God's attributes and his providence so Oops. that they can think everything happens accidentally or so necessarily that nothing can be thwarted or that God's rule is sleepy, unjust, haphazard, and erratic. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, this is good stuff. Oh, well, there's good stuff in here. But like, yeah, we couldn't just jump around picking stuff. Hmm. That's phenomenal. It's so good. All right, yeah. I got good a free times. copy. <laughs> Sounds good. You'll have Thank to buy you, it. sir. Thank you, everybody. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.